I'm gonna try texting Mary. She's she's so prompt. I don't know. She maybe got confused about the workshop today. But yeah, we're gonna just start to try to do it. Right. So. Yeah. And is there four of us here right now, I guess? Yeah, I get, I think uh, Kevin's online. So yeah. Justin. Okay. Is there low hanging fruit we can start with? I was going to just kind of walk through the same. August is at UX. I want to like get the EDD stuff. Right. Then um, first. That sounds great. Okay. I, should I open the meeting? Yeah. Might as well. Yeah. We just get we good on my desk. Got lots of screens. It's pretty good. Yeah, All right. It's uh, 2.01 p.m., uh, November 15th. I will open this uh, Grand County Commission uh, budget workshop. Present are county commissioners, present in the chambers are county commissioners, uh, Clapper, uh, Stock, myself, uh, Hadler, and online we have commissioners Kevin Walker and, did you say Josie was online? Josie. And uh, Commissioner Kobosh. Uh, we also have Strategic Development Director Chris Baird, and uh, Associate County Administrator Quinn Hall, um, and various department heads and concerned public. <laughs> All right, meeting's open. I'm going to turn it over to our Strategic Development Director, Chris. Um, okay, so I think we'll roll through in the same order we did yesterday. We'll tackle the changes that uh, August suggested yesterday and uh we can't run advantage on his end so i'm gonna he's gonna walk us through and i'm gonna run the budgeting software to go but i think august has already plugged in the uh the changes and so it's kind of more a matter of saying no i don't want this or to change something around which might be easier um so August, you ready to go? Walking us through. Yep. So. <clears throat> so di didn't we walk through yesterday? I mean, shouldn't we just? We're at the point of making decisions now. So I'm, when I say walk through, just like go through, unless somebody has an alternative way to do it, <clears throat> but walk through all the decision points we discussed yesterday. And okay. just. That know, sounds good to me. Form a consensus first, and if we can. Then Jabo asks for a motion. <clears throat> so um, to start, can we go to the professional services line? It's 310, 482310. Okay. So um, the first changes um, have no budget impact. It was increasing the data man data insight management line up from 20,000 to 30,000. Um, that was pursuant to uh, reflections of what Adam Whaling quoted he could do um, those services for. Uh, it, decreases, it decreased the visitor resident survey cost um, down from 50,000 to 25,000, um, and then added a special event analysis section, um, which would, would, would be able to provide some insights into six special events at two and a half grand per event. Um, so all that data stuff basically net neutral per the previous request, um, but changes are there. Any concerns okay. with those line items? I mean, my, my one concern is that the, the band, dang, that band Wango art trails app yeah. thing is get, receiving more funding than art trails itself. Hmm. Um, and if that's an annual thing, it just seems sort of silly to me. Yep. So that's uh, so that is in the section. I was I was going to maybe try to do it by like chunk, but yeah, let's talk about that. Um, so there's also the yeah there's the ten thousand, which is the software cost for the band Wango, which is a, basically an engagement tool to drive visitors towards um, the the art trails sculptures um, in town. Um, that is a new program. We haven't explored it yet. Um, separately, there's a different line where we've brought the art trails contribution up to the full 5,000 that was requested. 
it, is Bandwango an actual app? You need to download it and then you follow the cues on it. I don't think you necessarily, it's, it's, there is a, a, a software component that, that guides folks through the interaction, um, whether it's software that's on your phone as an app or it's on like a browser, um, so you don't have to download something. It is like an actual, the software is what's engaging you and, and guiding you through the experience. It's not something we can combine with a Wander app. They're, so they're different. Um, different programs. Perhaps. You you could you could perhaps for example create like a a, a sub map on Wander that says here's all the art trails and have a little thing on it. Um, we could certainly do that. Um, but you know again this is a I haven't had the demo with them yet. This was just a, trying to hold some budget um, in case uh, we felt really good about this. And all signs from everyone I've talked to who've worked with the software feel really good about it. But again. You know, it's something new. If we feel like we can't stomach all the changes on here, that would be one that I'd be willing to give up. Um, anyone else have an opinion on it? I could. I mean, I, I, see I think it's, point. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, well, I, I I see Sarah's point too, but it's it's a relatively small amount of money. I think it does make ex make sense to experiment with. Um, New technology things. I mean, yeah, I think I think the way people, yeah, I, I don't think we're explore, ex, um, exploiting cell phone apps and websites and all the all that stuff as as much as we could be. And, and so, not every single idea is going to work out. But it, since it's cheap in the context of this budget, yeah. I'm, I would be willing to give it a try. But, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not. I like the idea of people appreciating that the art. It's, I'm fine with that going through. All right. And another thing to realize is it's easy to make question amendments <clears throat> within a department as long as the bottom line stays the same. It's a uh, change of mind. We said, no, we don't want to do this. We want to switch it over to more funding for events or artwork <clears throat> shows. And that's useful. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I do have a, a general comment that I think applies to all this stuff, which is, if and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I, but I think these these add-ons to the EDD budget are being drawn out of reserves, and these are less restricted reserves, which could also be spent on responsible trail stuff or films or other, other things. So um, that makes, you know, I, I think when we've got money that can only be spent with the tourism development and pr promotion, we tend to be a little bit less critical, you know, just because those funds, funds are so narrowly restricted. Um, but the, these are not as narrowly restricted as the usual thing. And um, so when I think com instead of just comparing it to like other tourism related advertising might, we might want to do, we, you know, this is money that could go to trail trail ambassadors in the future if they needed to draw out of reserves. So. Yeah, I mean, we're essentially in a way reviewing the Travel Council Advisory Board's recommendations right now. Okay. Um, Anyone else have comment on this block? I'm, I'm first Let's see. Also, there is one additional um, change in this particular block that is the international market consulting for 10,000. Um, that was explained yesterday. So basically part of the kind of reinvigorating our international strategy um, so that we're not, so that we have additional, um, you know, basically strategy to bring to our events, our um sales missions, whatnot, so that we have a Moab specific strategy rather than just um, piggybacking off of the state office is what, which is what we do at the moment. Um, given what, what Kevin was mentioning earlier, how this is coming from the less restricted reserve. Um, I'm okay with something like international marketing consulting coming out of that, but I, it's all part of this bigger conversation. Like I want to make sure not too much of this money is spent entirely on advertising. So as we talk about the $100,000 ask for additional study strict marketing, I'm thinking about the fact that we've agreed to add this international marketing component. Yeah, I think that's very fair. Um, okay, can I, can I touch on the international kind of block? Um, so in addition to that consulting piece, um, if you go to paid media, um, which is 860. 
Um, there's an additional $20,000 in here for um, cooperative marketing that we'd be doing with the state and international markets. And then there's two, yeah. go ahead. Is that a different type of marketing then? So the first one that I mentioned, the 10,000 would be basically strategy. Um, and then this would be the actual dollars we're putting into market um, in terms of actual paid media. So we'd apply the strategy to the, to the marketing. Yep. And to the trade shows, which is the next piece. Um, so the other two international kind of focus sections, which I think are really essential and are basically, you know, I just didn't, I missed uh, this piece in the initial round. I think it's really essential are adding some money to the travel trade show line, which is 900. Uh, so the additions here are the Go West and IITA conferences, which were recommended by the state and discussed at length at the Travel Council Board meeting, and then international sales missions under 910, um, which adds two sales missions, one to Canada and then one to Switzerland slash Austria. Those are similar to the, to the trips that like Melissa just took to correct. To Australia. Yep. So it's it's cooperative. All of the DMOs throughout the state go with the state to a particular market. Uh, in which they're speaking with, um, you know, media as well as uh, travel agents. You know, it's really our opportunity to tell to the international market our message um, about visiting our area. I think all that seems fine. Like forty, around forty thousand dollars for international, yeah. compared to our other budget, seems reasonable. Okay. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to events. We already spoke about the art trails piece in Banduango, which sounded like I didn't get any dissent on on either of those. Right. Um, I will again, then the special event grant, which is um, 820. There you go. Yep, at, that was at 10,000, brought that up to 40,000 to be more in line with historical expenditures. Um, and I think a more impactful program. Um, and then the same with 600, which is community engagement. Under community engagement is the um, community grant, community event grant program. Any concerns or dissent on either of those? August, how much was the MOAB grant last year? <clears throat> it was 55 grand. And how much was applied for? We got, we only dispersed 37 or so. So it was undersubscribed. So does the remainder roll over to this year or is it just start over? Okay. Start over. It would just go to reserves, but it wouldn't be restricted by any particular right. okay. account. But, you know, if, if that's like a, a certainly a way of thinking, well, we're not going to spend 15 grand or so of this program. You know, you could create a small, small version of it that's saying logically, well, we put money into this last year, we're not going to spend it and we can carry it over and pull a subsequent amount from reserves. Um, if that's a program that the commission is, is excited about, I'd be happy to carry that out in a smaller fashion next year. Um, I think that the whole idea behind that grant is in order to provide local businesses an advertising edge over some of the bigger corporate conglomerates that are moving into town. And so it it's trying to like prioritize small business and do all this stuff. And I think it was undersubscribed likely because there wasn't enough advertising on it for out, outreach or something. And it came out when the big big star grant came with out. big star grants. Right. Yeah. Look at the what, what was yeah. that was there a business size cap on that? Or how did we just start? Yep. yep. There was a there is a um, employee number size of I believe okay. ten full time e equivalent. Yeah, so I mean I like the idea of that grant, um, and I would be in favor of cutting down the additional steady strip marketing, which is just sort of a catch all term, and it 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 usually probably favors those bigger corporate 
conglomerates who are competing with their own advertising money. Uh, so I would be in favor of shifting some of that towards this Moab grant, but I'm not sure how other people will feel. You're talking about the smaller grant. The smaller grant. For yeah. Small businesses to advertise. The, the tourism grant, basically. And, and I think what I'd throw out to that comment is that um, you know Ben's thought of reviewing a star grant, and I think this commission's conversation about reviewing a star grant and um, you know the Moab grant is that having some kind of resource that is small business development that is tourism oriented um, is a good idea, um, and that it doesn't have to exactly be like a star for tourism or Moab grant, you know, just a small business development grant for tourism businesses. And then, you know, you could leave, basically say when, you know, hey, Ben, what would be your ideal version of this based off of all the grant kind of feedback you got last year? And just give an amount that feels appropriate based off of the the uh, sizes of, of the programs that we have. I think that's a great idea. Is that other category you just spoke of, small business development grant, is that reflected in the budget? I, I was using that as a catch-all of how I would describe, if you were wanting to add something like this, that's how I would describe it. Um, Instead of the specific MOAC grant. Yeah, because, I mean, it would be different, I think. I would rename the line item. Yeah. Right. Well, I would be, I would be but the I mean, that. Do you know that I kind of perturbed about uh, tourism yeah. businesses getting diversification funding? And so, but somebody did mention we would like to see similar funding for tourism related businesses. And I think that this is right of that. Where did that only rate? I mean, yeah. And, and we learned a lot this year on, on how to. We learned a lot. Yes. How do you, August, feel about rearranging from that that other line that Sarah mentioned and upping the the steady drip line? Yeah. What do you have an opinion on that, Chris? No. <laughs> That's it. I, I I think that um. You know, I think it's a good idea. So. I, you know, I would recommend that we do, you could put it in like the Moab grant line, basically, um, which is what, 830? Um, How much are we talking about? Same so I guess for, I'll just throw some numbers of what we had last year. So we put 500,000 into Star Grant last year from diversification, ended up being a million. We put $55,000 into the Moab grant last year. We put in $50,000 $50, in the special event grant last year. Um, you know, the bigger it is, the bigger impact it's going to be. So, I'll, but I'll, I'd leave that up to the commission to kind of come up with the number, unless you want me to throw it out there, I'll, whatever you need me to do. Well, you're talking about transferring money from steady drip to the. Yes. How and much, how much? Up, like 50,000. I don't know. It's off the top of my head. It's half of what steady drip was. was well, steady drip was 100, right? Yeah. So the request was doubling it, basically. How about 60, 40? 60,000. 60 for steady drip, 40 for the grant. I think I think that sounds reasonable to me, especially since last year we dispersed. Mm -hmm. seven, now. Well, it's not 60, 40 because the steady drip is actually 200,000. Yeah, I, I think we need a separate discussion on the separate yeah. drip. I wouldn't want to decide what we're going to spend there in the context of talking about these Moab grants. Uh, okay, where is the steady well, drip? I guess. It's in paid 000. media. Also, all, all of this is coming out of reserves, so it doesn't make sense to rearrange the budget I mean, we're already dipping into reserves. So I, I think I would just, you know, if we're going to increase or decrease something, we don't need to compensate for it elsewhere because it's already over budget in some sense and we're using reserves. Uh, well, we don't want to go further over budget. Well, I just think I'd like to point out to the Travel Council who requested that we put more money in advertising that this is actually for local advertising. So in a sense, it's a similar line item you know what i mean yeah and it could have a bit of a multiplier effect as well since the money stays local so so i guess my my general comments on the steady drip line which i which i'm interpreting as being it's, it's advertising that's not fly market and it's not international and it's not the local stay on you know it's sort of just the more generic sort of advertising yep. it'd basically be probably drive market domestic um year-round kind of staying in market presence yeah and so when we were um the previous round of that just a few months ago when we were discussing it it was kind of weird than that we decided how much we were going to spend first and then only later did we get to you know see what the ads are actually going to be which seems kind of backwards to me 
So, so my inclination is to cut this down to the original, just 100,000 as in the previous version of the budget. And then once we develop the ads and see what they are and, and see what kind of effect we think they're gonna have and are they more educational or are they more trying people here, you know, then we could elect to spend additional money if, if they seem good. But I don't, you know, given that we've got all this other advertising that we're committing to, I don't feel good about, you know, this, is, this extra 100,000 seems kind of random to me we don't even know what the ads are and what we're trying to accomplish with them. So, well, I'll also make the point that just because you budget for it doesn't mean that it's really authorizing August to spend the money. You could say we're budgeting for it, but you can't spend the money until we approve it. That that's true, but I think the way it often works is you know three months from now, office says, "Well, the budget's already even approved," and we say, "Yeah, okay." So it, I think it it takes a little discipline. For, yeah. Right, well, maybe somebody can make a motion. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're, so, were we, and are we talking about the entire EDB or just? Uh, well, just maybe on this, the you know, the balance between steady drip and the low, well, low right. small business towards related grants. Um, there are two other things really quickly that are changes that we haven't discussed yet, um, which are um, a small $5,000 contribution. Um, Part of the MIC contribution, which is an 810, which would be to basically buy technology, whether that be iPads or whatever, to support the role of HB 180 um, at the MIC. Um, yep. And so that would be specifically like someone walks in the door, they need to get their, their OHV permit license, and they don't have a device. Well, here's the iPad that you can do the thing on, and then we'll, we'll give you the permit or it'll email, whatever, however that works. But because right now there's not really a good way for them to do that. Um, and then the last one was in paid media, um, the $100,000 for the timed entry visitor education um, for next year. So I just wanted to, before we get too far into motion making, just wanted to make sure that those two were in the discussion pot. I, I like the idea of additional timed entry education. I, I think it's important um, you know, that the timed entry systems is a big deal and it's not you know, the final decision hasn't been made. So, um, you know, letting people it helped, know a, it. It helped a lot last year. I think we did 200,000 last year with the rollout. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming August, the idea is by, by this year, quite a few people already know about it. So we don't need to spend quite as much as we did last year. I, I think that's a thought. Yeah. Kevin, did you want to make a motion around the steady drip line? I, yeah, I, I would move that we, we cut it back to what it was originally, which is $100,000. I'm in favor of that. Seconds. Yes. And then, did we want to spend the ex that extra hundred thousand dollars towards a Moab grant, or are we just we'll we just like cutting that? Yeah, we're gonna do it. Let's do it separate. So. Okay, sounds good. And, and just for discussion on the moding, I, I mean, I just would note that this 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 chunk of you know, it's it's a it's a minor. We've already got a lot of ad spending in the budget. Um, most of it is either, you know, it's, it's focused on, you know, markets that we're trying to develop, like the fly markets because of, you know, you know, ch changing the, you know, visitors who will spend more and stay longer. And we think they tend to be international or flying in. Um, and, and then we have, you know, we have other advertising that's directly aimed toward visitor behavior. It's, it's fed through the responsible recreation program. Um, and, the, and then I, I guess I'm, the reason I want to keep it at hundred thousand dollars for now is that this this really hasn't been specified. You know, we don't know precisely what this is going to be. We got we got a little bit of approval preview last year, um, but I think it makes more sense to pr proceed with developing this this advertising that would be for the drive-in markets. But then once we see what the what the message is and what our goals are, then decide. You know, we could revise that hundred dollars spend upward at that time after after we see the ads. So. Um, one, one quick process question on that is 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 the commission amenable to a budget amendment in the first quarter of the year because that's what that would require I, I believe right i speaking for myself I, i'm amenable to it yeah i think the point is is if there's something that's attractive then yeah yeah okay so, sweet um, but i i think to kevin's point i i i let the record show that the uh fly market campaigns have been increased and, and there's been a lot of focus on on that to years past from years past there's increases in the fly market there's increases in the international 
Yeah. Um, and and the visitor education around the experience once they're here in terms of the time entry, local billboards. So this whole chunk is going up, isn't it? Even if we, if we decrease the uh, the steady drip line here, the overall paid media line is still increasing. That's correct. All right. All in favor of Kevin's motion? Aye. Yes. Is, is, is Josie on? Yep. Sorry. I. This is okay. Josie. I. Thanks, Josie. All right. It looks like that. Was that everybody? That was everybody. Yeah. And Trisha Dabson. She's out. Yeah. Save it. All right. Then on the. The tourism related small business grants. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do want to back to the point that all of this is coming from those reserves. I don't want to go too crazy with it, but what do people think about the 40,000? So, so these would be similar to the STAR grants, but for tourism-related businesses? They'd be the same as the MOAB grant this year that we offered to small businesses for promotional activities. Well, I believe we would give it up to Ben to come up with a, the proposal to analyze yeah. what happened and what would best serve the community, but it would be small business-related de development. Because in particular, I, I think there, there are different criteria we could consider. And one thing that was discussed at the meeting on the STAR grants is that you know there is the possibility of diversification within the tourism sector. And and so I, you know, I, I guess we can wait for Ben to propose something, but I think rather than just, you know, hand it out to any small businesses that wants it, I think we would look to, you know, just broaden the range of tour, tourism related businesses. So. Yeah. So I think, I think what I would take away from this is whatever amount you give, we would basically try to take best practices from the experience this year with the Moab grant and the STAR grant and come up with kind of a 2.0 for tourism specific small businesses in the community um, that we'd fund up to the amount decided here today. And we'd bring that proposal to you before we move forward. Okay. And, and, I, and again, I, I think, I mean, Sarah's suggestion of 40,000 sounds fine to me. And if we, and, I, and I'm open to increasing it later once we see more specifically what the parameters of the, of the grant are. I like 40. Everybody go 40. Yes, sounds like it. I don't think you put a one in the unit there. Yeah. Zero times 40. <laughs> Very well. All right. All right. Uh, next block that we're working on i think that's it for for tourism promotion okay. those are all the tcap changes did and we call for a vote a second and a vote on that one we did it was consensus, yeah, yeah, oh, it was consensus. um is this where we would get into the positions from the department or maybe if we're done with is there anything else we need to tackle on economic development august there was no changes to economic diversification. Um, the only the only proposal was additional um, funding to the film commission from the economic diversification line, um, which my understanding would be that we'd have a we're having a separate conversation about the film commission that we'd have first. I would imagine. All right. So you guys want to tackle that topic now before we move on to the additional part? Yeah. Yeah. I think sure. It's got to do it sometime, right? And then these people. Yeah. Where, which tab is that one in? Uh, it should be in the rectum conventions tab. Oh, okay. like tab oh yeah. Okay. Uh, August, were you leading this? I, I certainly can, if you'd like me to. Um, why don't you start us out, August? Like okay, bit. so I um, took a look at um, the five-year annual average for contributions from Grand County to the Film Commission. Um, I'll just take me one second to pull it up. 
And the, the average contribution is uh, 82,763. Um, some numbers that we, we looked at, um, the current initial 2023 Film Commission budget request um, from our department adds up to 147,412, which is 178% of average. And then that initial Red Cliffs request is 240,000. Um, what was, what was 2022, August? Uh, well, we're, we haven't spent it all yet, so it's hard for me to exactly tell. Do you know what was but budgeted? The program budget was about 75, um, and then staff uh, salary and benefits was probably closer to 90. So I bet it would be 160 total um, budgeted for 2022. Um, okay, but not, not, a, not necessarily spent. Not necessarily spent. Um, I, I, I so those was, are the numbers. Okay, yeah, and I, I saw that in the email, but one thing that jumps out to me is that in the five years that you averaged, weren't we only paying half the film Correct. commission's budget? Yep. So that's worth noting. So basically, historically, before the film commission became wholly under the operations of Grand County, we jointly funded it with the city with a small contribution from San Juan County of basically five grand. Um, and so, you know, in the past, Grand County's obligation was about 50 percent. This year, we've increased our our support of the film commission about double. Um, by taking it on fully, um, and so those those that was kind of the, like the historical context for thinking about um, the contribution or or the budget for for this next year. I had my own thoughts. I can share those now, or I can let the commission, you know, share their opinions based on that. Do you want me to share my thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Um, I. You know, in, in looking at those numbers um, and considering the kind of Red Cliffs um, offer of a kind of joint partnership in a way and kind of for from, from Grand County, basically functionally going back to where we were in the past, um, which was con contributing to an outside agency to fulfill um, film commission duties. Um, you know, I think that if we, if the commission contributed hundred thousand dollars, it'd be, it'd be higher for 2023. It'd be a higher amount than we've ever contributed in the past five years before we took it on fully, um, which I think is warranted. I think we should give above, above the average number of 82,763. And, and that's in large part, you know, there's inflationary cost pressures. We've had increased film activity in our area. Um, I think that there's a possibility that doing so um, could decrease the pressure on the rec film budget for this year, um, which would allow us to fund $50,000 towards responsible recreation, um, which could kind of going past this count, past conversation, maybe that conversation's over, um, you know, relieve some of the pressure from the tourism budget for re responsible recreation um, and drive more to marketing if that's a conversation we want to do or just to offset that cost. Um, and in net sum, I think that would respond to the Travel Council Advisory Board's recommendation of um, either driving money from diversification towards TRT or towards film or partnering with an outside entity um, to increase total um, support of, of the film commission. Um, depending on what Red Cliffs, how, how you know, they would respond to um, that uh, contribution, the initial request from Red Cliffs was $240,000. Assuming that Red Cliffs would cut basically the corresponding 140,000 from their operating budget, the the total contribution from Red Cliffs would be 250,000, and plus 100,000 would be a total budget for Film Commission of 350,000, which would be unprecedented for the last, you know, since we have records for it. So I think that going this way would be an appropriate response to what we're seeing in the film industry locally. Um, it would make good on, on you know, uh, the request of the Travel Council Board, and I think would be a good way for us to, um, you know, address the fact that we are seeing a really huge increase in film activity in our area, and at least for one more year with the state film tax incentive. So that's my, that's my two cents. Thanks, August. I want to weigh in. Uh, um, go ahead, Kevin. <clears throat> I was just going to say that another way of looking at it is, you know, for for many years, the, the city and the county jointly funded film, you know, film commission and related activities at 
I'm guessing around 150, 160,000, if, if that average represents half. Um, and then we budgeted a similar amount last year, and you know, this draft budget has that amount. So, you know, you you could say that you know at least for the first year we should continue to fund funded it. I mean, it, it is true that the county's portion has gone up, but the city's has gone down correspondingly. So, if you just look at the total local government contribution to the film commission, you know, hundred thousand dollars actually is a pretty significant cut from what it has been in the past. Um, now, it doesn't mean that we, you know, we have to keep funding at those levels forever, but, um, you know, it, I, I guess you know, we should at least consider, just, you know, keeping the the amount rough, roughly the same, which would be more like $140,000, $150,000. I, mean, I kind of disagree with that in the sense that if the film commission moves outside of the county, it ceases to be this public entity. And so the public has been invested in it. It's supposedly been serving the public. If all of a sudden it goes to this nonprofit that's controlled by a certain entity that's trying to increase tourism and film on their particular property, it just feels kind of irresponsible to continue funding it in, at the level of like a public entity when it's clearly gonna be different with, I mean, a different oversight um, and and private funding as well with a different board makeup. All of these changes make me feel that we need to be number one very clear about what we're getting out of our contribution, like a, a firm contract with the deliverables outlined that are the job description, but also that we should rein the funding back in so it doesn't look like we're just giving public sector money to the private the more private enterprise. Yeah. I mean that 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 makes some sense to me, but just to, just to play devil's advocate, you know, we could also say, well, we first year we funded at at the higher levels, and then we just see how it how that went, and if we like the like what the private entities are doing, you know, we could keep a relatively high contribution. If we don't like it, you know, we can cut it, you know, as as low as we like. But you know, rather than making assumptions about how it's going to go, you know, just give them a Give it a year, a trial year to see. Can I say something? Am I allowed to? Love the commission. Okay. I think that uh, August did have the point that if, if the partnership with the nonprofit went forward, it would be um, funded at a higher level than it ever has been before. And so that that is reassuring to me that it would. Uh, not just continue to prosper and do good work, but that it would also hopefully grow and mature to serve folks well. I should I should offer that as a caveat. I think that that number that's an assumption, right? That's an assumption that they would that Red Cliffs would the foundation would would cut the corresponding amount of what we're not contributing. So you know that's a, that's assumed based off of the current budget, but I can't speak for what would actually happen. And remind me, August, that the budget that was presented yesterday had like a bunch of, there was also a museum and a lot of different stuff. So the number you are qu quoting is the, the big increase. That was just the more narrowly focused film stuff? Or was it the, the entire? That, that's one? correct. Nope, that's correct. That's Film Commission operating expenses as described in the proposed budget from Red Cliffs. Okay, okay Mary, go ahead. Well, there are certain obligations that the county you know, has to report. And so by um, funding it through this uh, and we have an MOU, those um, requirements will be fulfilled through a nonprofit. And so I think I would agree, be a little closer to um, agreeing with Kevin. You know, I think there's at least those things need to be done. They need to have happened. And if those were clear in our MOU, what we what has to happen for us to feel like our contribution is going to our you know the needs of the town are failing fulfilling the obligations of the county right so it sounds right. like are, are we in relatively general agreement that it's a good idea to to give it to red Cliffs in essence and we're just talking about the amount that we want to support it at this point Right. I think we have to realize that we need to keep the budget the way
way that it is right now. Yeah. And then enter the negotiation. But sure, five months is three. Right. And and see where that goes. I don't know that we necessarily have to pick, you know, what that looks like right now, but I think it definitely can include a contract, a good contract for services. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and um, and then you know we have to set it amount at some point. But I don't think that we can reduce budget yet. We really haven't entered into a contract yet. That makes a lot of sense. So, so, uh, so this is being put as for the purpose of this exercise and and getting a tentative budget for the whole county together. I'm comfortable of holding the as a placeholder having this the rolling over the same budget or the budget as presented right until we have a a contract in place that kind of like outlines at what point we can decide yeah. what of that we want to support the. Project of that course. And you'd have to decide whether or not the terms of the contract were would work for you too. Right. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I and mean, we put, like I said, we we designed that based on the studies that we had seen for film commission with other film commissioners in other areas that are doing a similar job to what Big was doing, but that she could live comfortably. Um, and then as an admin position, basically, and uh, and some travel, and that was it. Um, you know, I don't see, I think what you guys are proposing is absolutely fair. And I don't think that anyone on the right course side would say no to that. Um, we certainly expect that there needs to be further discussions about the deliverables. Right. Uh, but once it's a 501c, we answer to a whole other different authority, which is going to answer the questions you need to be held accountable for as well. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to you know, what are the things that we, that Fika does outside of her job that we'd like to see continue, you know, and I think we all want to see those continue. Um, and, you know, as I said, this is really just as kind of a startup year. We are, you know, we're very interested in getting uh, private sector money in to help support, you know, the foundation as a whole, of which this would be a part of that and um, supporting the arts. So, yeah. So what was the timeline on uh, getting official with 501c3? So we have applied and we were told it would be 12 to 16 weeks for an answer. Our lawyers say they, that usually it takes between six to eight is usually what they say. So hopefully, um, I mean, either way we're gonna proceed. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't think that anybody is looking at making any drastic steps before January 1. Yeah. So from a budget standpoint, you guys can still ratify a budget. Yeah. So yeah. So what I mean, like I said, my recommendation is to maintain the budget that we've got, and then we can't even enter into an agreement with five months to three and help official. Correct. So we won't even, you know, that's probably something you know in the beginning of the year that we can revisit. And uh, but you know, if we can get some draft agreements uh, to share with one another before then, yeah, while rolling. We have reams and reams of incorporation and how it's going to be set up, then how sure. the board is designed. So I'm happy yeah, to I mean, share from our side, way. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, if you have specific terms, um, shoot them over to us so that we can start considering them also. Yeah, sure. But for us, you know, we, there's uh, certain duties that we need to um, accomplish in the film commission. And uh, there might be some other duties outside of that that. Viga and you guys want to deal with, but you'll have to fund that separately uh -huh. from your own uh, property. Yeah, so just for clarification, it sounds like you aim to create a nonprofit entity that's separate from the management group of. Oh, completely. Graduate. Yeah. Do you have a, a vision for the, the board? Or? It's uh, going to be between seven to nine members. I can send you all the specifics on that. Uh, primarily, we've decided that it needs to be. Majority women and minorities. Um, so we think that that is underrepresented. Um, and then there is a, a, a basically a placeholder for um, Grand County, someone from here to be a member. And uh, we've had some initial discussions uh, with San Juan County. And um, you know, they're very, they think that it's a great idea as well. Um, and they haven't quite outright asked for a position on the board, but we're not opposed to it. 
Um, we want two community seats, which would be open to community, and then uh, three spots, which would be filled by someone who's at Red Cliffs. So the majority of the board would not be controlled by Red Cliffs. It would actually be controlled by outside entities, and it would be like any other board. Um, and the positions would be um, renewed or appealed yearly is how we're basically running it. So, yeah, there, yeah that makes sense. Like you put a lot of thought in that already. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm excited about this follow here. So. Yeah, that, that is. That's, that's, okay, so are we, are we in agreement on this that we'll keep the budget as it is tentatively? And then once we uh, work out details with the Red Cliffs folks, then we can uh, drill down and see how much we want to support. Yes. Josie or Kevin, any any further thoughts on that? Oh uh, no, that that sounds fine to me. So it, it sounds like the. Too bad. We can do I'm that sounds good to me as well. Uh, just process wise. Okay, Sarah. I just wanted to hear if we, we get someone to speak. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I I don't think in the world of I think that the discussion when this all came up was that it isn't. I wouldn't. I'm not red. I wouldn't be red cliffs in any way. At all. I can at all. I literally am the film commissioner. I get my autonomy back. I'm able to continue to give to the community, to bring to the community, to work globally as I have for the past seven years of my life. Literally doing the same thing, but actually just getting. But be, being supported from the different entities. It's literally the Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission. I'm an AFCI certified member. I do it all the way I have been doing. So I just want to be clear on that too. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Should we? So we're in consensus on that one, I believe. Uh, um, moving on to the positions in the EDD, correct? Yeah, let's see. Renee, you want to uh, so take over? I think so. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks guys. Brian and Bega. Yeah. Appreciate it. EDD is in this yellow color, just because we haven't um, settled on a, a name change for these yet. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, so these are just the two grade changes. Um, Ben's position is currently at grade nine at um, Economic Development Specialist. Um, that would be pumping, bumping it up to a grade 11. Um, and calling it something along the lines of Assistant Economic Development Director or maybe EED or Economic Development Manager um, with an increased duty um, and some supervision there. And then um, redrafting that admin assistant job description, which is currently pretty special events heavy to, in, to encompass some more economic development programming and um, data analysis out of it. Um, the proposed costs on those would be about seven thousand for Ben's, and um, about three thousand for the admin role. That was I get I get Ben. I think I like the Ben's position. I think that's I think he's done above and beyond this year and been extremely effective. I might get the justification for that. So, but I wasn't quite sure of the other one because we're taking away the special events duties from that role, right? Are you still there, August? Yep. I can I can talk through my thinking on that. Yeah. Um, so basically, you know, this role used to be admin assistant plus a little bit of special events. Um, and it's grown in terms of just like daily duties to basically become a little admin with a lot of special events. Um, as the special event piece is moving, you know, I saw that as an opportunity to, you know, build this, build this role. You know, it's hard to get a brand new position in an office. Um, but for us, we have so much growth 
and so much kind of capacity constraint, especially on the economic diversification side. You know, we're creating this $80,000 program for workforce development. We're creating a new strategic plan planning process. And, um, you know, ideally also having someone who can be a point person on all of our data, whether that be occupation, occupancy, or occupation, um, economic and otherwise. Um, and so the thought was, well, let's take this role that's already changing. The special event part is going away and, you know, build it up. So it's, it's, I see it more than simply filling the whole of the special event component of it. I, I see it as really big, building it bigger than um, what it was before so that we have a really good contributing member of, of, of um, kind of our programming um, that carries some of those admin duties kind of on the side, but really the main focus is program development, you know, in a much as the way that, that Ben filled in after I moved up to a develop, uh, to a, to a direct direct role. In some ways I see this as like, you know, as Ben gets into this director, kind of assistant director role, having a second Ben below him um, in some ways, if that makes sense. So with that, with that position answer to the economic development manager position? Yeah, so it would be it would be managed. I mean, probably jointly in some ways. You know, in some of the budget stuff and admin duties, that would be my purview. But yeah, Ben would be able to have some supervisory duties over both the Vista and that kind of program ED manager position. Yeah. yeah has there been a where are we on the development of a job description for this? Uh, very loose. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a lot to be program manager, data anal analyst. And I think, um, if anything, the data probably goes away. Um, you know, we've put a lot of money into the data contracting and outsourcing that, as discussed earlier today. I really see it as two programs that we're building up, which is, um, you know, engaging with the high school, the college, and um, employers to build out this workforce development, much like what we did with childcare this year, where we started out with roundtables. We had conversations with the community and we figured out what the needs are and the opportunities are. And then we go after them with the funding that we have that's kind of carte blanche at the moment. And then the other piece is uh, being a strong outreach and community liaison with all of our partners to ensure that the strategic planning process goes off without a hitch and we have someone who's coordinating that. So those are the, probably the two big programs I'd be adding to it. August, my question is, um... How are you going to make up this cost, the uh, $11,824 in um, your budget as it is now? As it is now, um, I mean, my answer these days is just pull it from the reserves. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it would be, would be amenable to if that feels like uncomfortable, you know, to, to take a look at what's already in there. And I'd be happy to trim 11000 from various programs to get to that number. <clears throat> Yeah, I think you know when it comes when you know when you make an adjustment for salaries, it's good forever. Always. Right. So I don't like to fund forever annual obligations using one time loans. Yep. So I I yeah, I'd cut. You from... Really should trim trim your budget because we are we don't want to get too heavy on relying on fund balance. It's going to go away pretty soon because we'll use it up real fast. So you're yep. potentially going to have to make major, major cuts to your budget in the next two or three years. Right. And yeah. you don't no, want I... yourself in a position where you have to make cut salary. That's right. Word. Yeah. So I would cut some programming, um, I would imagine. A little on the fence, but the one still... Uh, yeah, which so which piece? What 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 uh, what is the sticking points that I can help resolve? I guess not knowing specifics as to the job description and where you could trim. Right. Well, I guess I can answer both of those. So in terms of trimming, you know, we have some uh, some program funding that is specific to you know staff engagement. We have a five thousand dollar line that's. Um, the intention there was to have some funding to do work for, workplace culture building um, elements like that, you know, whether that's an offsite or getting lunch for the office, you know, there's a couple thousand there that I could trim. Um, I'd have to take a closer look there, but, but um, 
you know, there's a handful of, of, of places I can imagine getting $11,000 from the program budget. Um, in terms of need, I think that that the main takeaway I've gotten this year is we need capacity in the office. Um, and, you know, I see this as an opportunity to, to do that um, on some of the program development side of things. Um, The capacity is remaining the same. What what we're talking about is an elevated skill set. That's yeah. what it each represents. Right. So what is the elevated skill set for the program manager admin assistant from the current job description? Right. I mean, right now basically this role with the special events out of it. Um you know, it, it's a very, it's, it's an admin role, right? It's, it's someone who we have, who's um, helping us administer the, the necessarily involved in program development. Um, and so, you know, the, the skill set I'm imagining is this is somebody who I can provide, um, you know, general direction to here's $78,000 for a workforce development program. Here's the people I need you to talk to come back to me in a month and see, you know, where, where is this where is this going and what what do you see the opportunities are um so that's a lot of self-directed action um and um you know proactive engagement um that i think is 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 would be the difference you know i don't think that's necessarily expected of an administrative assistant um role so renee where are other admin assistants in the county at? They're all at a grade seven. Yeah, I mean, we equalize admin assistance across the whole county at grade seven. Right. But so what I'm saying is this is, is no that... longer an admin role, is what I'm trying to say. Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> I, August said the same thing I was going to say. So. Um, right. How, much, how still... much of their time is taken up with admin duties? I mean, it, right now it's 70-30. It's special events. So when you say programming, I still don't understand what you mean. Like when you say they're going to develop programming, what kind of programming? Yeah. So, you know, the same way that this year, you know, Ben and I took a line item of $500,000 that really was nothing more than a concept, right? This, we're going to create a small business support grant program. Um, you know, turning that from just a dollar amount to a fleshed out program proposal, conversations with stakeholders, you know, we probably did 30 one-on-ones with businesses to figure out what needs looked like, you know, understanding how to facilitate with the county commission to, to have the conversations necessary to, to build out that proposal, build out the processes to respond to um, and do grant committees. Um, you know, I think that the, the workforce development piece is something that we really got a lot of demand for helping to understand how we can connect our high schoolers to apprenticeship programs at, at, at local employers. Um, you know, that's a big, vague, opaque question mark um, that I don't have policies and procedures to just tell someone to go implement, right? That's something that needs to be built and constructed. Um, and it's your and Ben's job. Right. What I'm saying is our job is so big that we, we weren't able to do that this year. You know what I mean? And so I'm asking for help to achieve the economic diversification priorities, I guess is what I'm saying. So, so just to clear, are we just talking about line 22 here, like a $2,700 bump? Is that, or is it multiple? Yeah, that's where we are. I mean, the, okay. the issue about, you know, position requests is that they have ramifications across the whole county, all the departments in Washington DC. So, yeah, there's a there's an element of equity that we have to employ, and uh, so you know, there's matters in principle in that state. I mean, I I think equity is important, but I th I think rigidity can also be a problem. I I found what August said kind of persuasive. This is a relatively small amount of money, and a and it's going to be paid for out of TRFT funds, which we have a lot of. And, and if if in the future, you know, we need to rein in some other programs there's plenty of places to do it in this trt budget so i'm 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 in favor of this i think it makes sense which portion of the trt is coming out of 
or revenue probably. Problem, no. What, what was that? Was? Sorry, no, go ahead. I just said revenue because yes. I would imagine this is an ongoing expense, right? No, I mean, is this, tea, is this tourism promotion? Is it economic development? Is it some mixture of those things? What? This, this would probably be mostly diversification because the programs that we're, we're um, expanding into would be more diversification oriented. But the admin duties maintain a split between both sides of the office for sure, well, which is how our salaries are built out. We already budgeted, I think, a 60 40 split, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's yeah. Okay. So I, that's, I, stand, I stand corrected when I said this comes out of a budget that has a lot. Yeah, that's well funded. Half of it comes out of that. All right, it is uh, three o'clock. Um, so I'm, I'm. Should we just vote on this? Haven't expressed support. Anyone else have any other opinions? I'm, I'm still. Well, let's have a motion. Figured out that way. <laughs> motion on the E D position. We're just talking about the uh, program right, manager, right, line twenty-two, right. not oh, okay. line twenty-three. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve. The the yeah, change. for can you scroll back over? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> she can see butter brush. They change for program manager of admin system. Uh, I approve that we approve the break uh, change for program manager and admin administration for the uh, health council office. Okay, I'll, I'll second. second. Okay. So I have a motion by Mary and a second by Kevin. Any I'm wondering. Discussion? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's probably not even worth considering just once you, once somebody's in a position, then, then they, they always become useful. You know, um, I was just wondering about doing this as a, a year pilot. Because yeah, I, like I have the same concerns that Chris has right. is once you do a it's, it's I think still once you do a pilot, so it's hard to it's, it's very hard, hard to change. So never mind. Mind. my yeah. idea is something worth considering. Yeah, not for that job, but hmm? not for something this small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean I'm much. I'm supportive of this because it, it sounds like if the admin assistant actually has enough time to do some program managing and it's helping our diversification goals. That is something that we need to work on. And if it's putting resources into the hands of our community, I think that's worth the $3,000 a year. Um, but if it turns out that this, if the person isn't able to put any time into program management, then I think we need to revisit it because they're not fulfilling the job description. But. Yeah. So if we have a good yeah. job description. And we can go back to just a straight up admin assistant. Yeah. If the job description is a good job. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy with that. Again, that does seem easier said than done. But... Yeah. I will say, I think we've changed this job description every year. Okay. <laughs> In the last two or three years, so at least. That's what's that's oh, there. Yeah. Keep moving. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, All in favor of the motion? Yes. Move on to band then. All right, so we've got four, four. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it looks like it passes. And Ben's uh, the assistant ED director. Um, I thought we already discussed that and people were in favor yeah, of it. Yeah, I, I, the most I like it. I'm in favor of that. Just I, I think we've gotten great value out of that position in the past. Does anybody object? No. All right, then consensus on Ben's great chain. Is that all for the economic development? That is. Okay. Okay, that's it. I think August. All right, you're good, August. Thank you so much, y'all. All right, join us. Have a good rest of your meeting. Uh, St. George. All right. Yeah, we we'll do. Cat and responsible grant while managing. Yes. Yeah. Sounds great. I move to approve the grade changes for active transportation and trails. Um, will you specify for? Responsible recreation coordinator and trails director. And yes, for responsible rec coordinator and trails director. Second. All right. All in favor of that? What should we discuss? Or, 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 or. <laughs> uh, I think Maddie made the case yesterday that her workload and her supervision role definitely 
qualify both her and Anna for this grade change. And I think it's really important that we work as a county to balance the pay gap between female and male employees. And like, you guys do a great job and you're managing so many people. So thank you. Thanks. And, uh, managing people is probably the most difficult part of any job. So thank you. Yeah, it's really, I, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I think bringing that relationship with the health department and other grant funding, yeah. it's uh, 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 are we chasing we include that in the measure? Not yet. Okay. Right. And I, as far as great as far as Anna's position too, I think we've got great value out of that position as well. It's, it's been a really good position, and it's moved that program forward immensely. Um, so I'm in favor of that one as well. Okay. All right. So looks like we have consensus on those. Okay. <laughs> Let's do the uh, then other two. So, um, the the Healthy Trails Coordinator and um, the Operations Tag, as we're calling it, for um, Tyson's switch there. The, the half Tyson position. Half Tyson. <laughs> We should come up with a much better name, right? I know I went over them yesterday, but if you guys have any questions today, that's your guarantee. Tyson's right. replacement will build such quality trail. Yeah, <laughs> Mason will be looking over your shoulder or her shoulder. Yeah, or her shoulder. Good point. Um, I I like both those, I'm happy yeah. with those. I think yeah. they're good value additions. Yeah, yeah, just to yeah. emphasize that the uh, full time trail ambassador position is half paid for by the health department, yes, and is also a translation from a part time to full time. So the actual so, cost is much lower than what's on the Yeah, I okay. think we, I think I calculated it out about 22, the actual increase is about 22,000. And that, that'll come with full county benefits, too, then, mm -hmm. right. All right, consensus on that? Okay. Sounds like okay, great. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Yes, <laughs> and um no promises, but I will say we're definitely planning on applying for grants too for different programs. So we might be able to like offset some of the um you know, ways. Cool. All right, well, if we're out early, we'll see you over at the uh celebration. <laughs> yeah, how late does it go? Uh, I think eight o'clock is all I have in me. Whoa! <laughs> How did it go this morning? Winter time. It's the middle of the night. Here. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. On to uh, thanks, Matt. Can we hop up to the top and uh, just yeah. go down the line. Uh, sure. Evidence tag that was um, originally proposed as a spillman um, full time position and the evidence tag at a grade 13. It's been cut down to the part time grade seven, which um, kind of equalizes it against a lot of the admin roles in county. Or the admin roles in county. It's good to make. Yeah, I mean, I'm critical of the, the budget of the sheriff's department in general, but I think that this position makes sense because it's creating a tech position with. To do a job that otherwise somebody who's much higher paid would have to do. So, uh, yeah, uh, kind of a compliance issue, also. Yeah. But it's also been negotiated down and there's been like quite a substantial. So, but the other part that we have to remember is that, and I've already put this in the budget for the sheriff. I don't know, should be on the sheriff or jail, but the thirty thousand dollar contract that has to have say whatever. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember. Chan talked about it yesterday, but so we, you know, we have this budget for the part time plus the thirty thousand dollar contract, which is still less than a full time employee. And uh, but sorry, the they thirty thousand revenue or expenditure. Isn't that the other position though? It was well, the the full time position would be covering both the SSA plus the evidence technician, and so instead we're going to contract for the. SSA and do the part time for the evidence then. Oh, right. Okay. It's still cheaper. Than yeah, originally it was 106, and now we're looking at about 60,000 with both of those that contract and then this position. So, yeah, about yeah, 40,000 reduction. 
Okay. And in addition, the sheriff's office dropped two. Right. Or drove down to each one. Oh, so like for that, what was that? Like 6,000 or something? Yeah. The two patrol deputies versus 202. <clears throat> Okay, that, that seems like a no brainer to me then. Yeah, thank you guys for putting that work in. Okay, we'll move on. Um, my position is next, the personal services coordinator. Um, originally proposed at a grade 13, we cut that down to just a coordinator. Um, the grade eight is equalizing it with my current payroll coordinator um, position. So it would be at the same level. Um, and the comp data kind of supports that grade eight for a tech or coordinator. If you made compelling uh, arguments for that yesterday, I'm happy with that. Okay. And that job will be advertised to hotel until we have that. Until we have office space. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, be, the budget for it right now is the full budget. It's probably going to not be a full year. No. Maybe, so, so, yeah. I mean, but then into the future forever. Yeah. yeah. Then it will be forever. But yeah. So, this is very useful. Yeah. Ask them for our yeah. I'm convinced. Okay. Um, the next one is a second deputy recorder. Um, the grade eight is where the current one deputy recorder is sitting. So they're requesting a additional deputy recorder for their office. I haven't heard from John. I that. haven't heard, and nobody's talked to us about why that is needed. And until we know why, I'm just not comfortable with saying. Well, the previous staffing analysis did call out an eventual need for another deputy reporter. Maybe that's where it comes from, but beyond that, I haven't heard anything from John. Yeah, when John brought this request to me, it was, um, I can read my little notes, but just to assist in the keeping up with current record keeping duties and processing and digitizing records. It's been digitized. But you don't know if that's what's gonna happen. So so since we haven't heard from John whatsoever, is this something we could if it is apparent that he absolutely needs this next year? Is it something we can look at an amendment for it sometime next year? Oh yeah, I kind of doing that. I mean, when we you know, something like this would require a public hearing because we wouldn't be able to just juggle money around. Yeah. If you can juggle money around in budget, then it doesn't require public hearing, but if you have to actually raise the total bottom line. Mm -hmm. On the general fund, that we have to have public hearing. So that's the process. It's right. not super onerous, but yeah, kind of. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I was definitely trying to look at this with an eye towards trimming so that we're not pulling from our reserves. And this is definitely a position that I could, I think that we probably shouldn't fund given that we're already proposing to pull around. More than eight hundred thousand from our reserves. Yeah, we're about fifty-three to four thousand okay. right exactly. now. That amount. So, would and that when you say we're over the target, over is that including this position or it is hopefully. okay? So, so another caveat that. is that it's almost always the case that between now and when I. Put all the finishing touches on the budget that I figure out that I forgot something, right. which normally makes the expense side go up a little. <laughs> so I'm kind of, I always kind of anticipate at this point in the game that once I tie all the loose ends up, and I'll be like, oh, I forgot this, I forgot that, maybe you know, sometimes that's worth it a hundred thousand more. Okay. Just from me double checking everything and reviewing all, all things, which I haven't done yet, but I will by the time that. Yeah, for me, just because we haven't heard from John at all to, to get a real justification for this, it's hard for me to include that. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, there's an element of being uh, accountable to the public for increasing the right. expenditure of their money. So, yeah, in a public forum hearing, the reasons for that without having that it is difficult. And Trish, won, Trish actually sent a text to, to me to, she had a few points and I forgot until just now, but she wanted to know that she was not for this position. Okay. So I move to, to deny to the recorder position request, the deputy recorder position request. Second. 
All right, any other discussion on that? Kevin, did you want to weigh in on the reporter at all? Um, I, I don't have anything to say that as an already been said. Are we voting? Okay. Yeah, we can vote. All in favor of the motion. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next up, uh, county engineer. Um, we heard about this one yesterday, grade 20. Um, I did pull the comps on this one, so that's updated comp compensation data. Um, kind of putting it at that grade 20. I think planning and zoning director is also currently at grade 20. Uh, Sorry, Mary, it's right here. Would they? Oh, I see. Thanks. Is that who their supervisor would be? Or would they be? I plugged it into the planning and zoning department, but it was a desk box place where I, I mean, my long-term strategy is to create, reform the community development department and under the community development department are divisions, planning and zoning, building inspection, engineering, and, you know, to try to tie them all together a little better. So where does stormwater fit into that? Um, all, all of them really yeah. deal with stormwater. So planning and zoning, building inspection, and I mean part of the trouble we've had in the past is that like the stormwater regulations are have been imposed at the planning and zoning level, but nobody's really you know inspecting them. Like the building inspector, the department wasn't really inspecting stormwater and didn't even receive the plans to review. So there's an, an element, I think it's much better now, but there's needs to be an element of more sort of cohesion between them all. But the engineer, if you hired an engineer, this person would be responsible for inspecting and certifying that they're built the way they're supposed to. And so, you know, I think that would take a little bit of the burden off of the building department when you're doing those things. But planning and zoning would work with the engineer to. So the way that the planning and zoning process works is that the private sector will present plans to us that engineers already stamped and given to us. And then our engineer has to check those plans for compliance. And if there's changes that need to be made, then those changes get made. But really the engineer is more of a review of what's already been created. And then once it, through the process of building the lots out, the engineer would be responsible to go out and look at all the improvements, not just stormwater, and certify that they're built up to standard. So we don't necessarily, we would, shouldn't plan on having like somebody in house to be able to draft plans like the new bike path or road uh, water catchment basement. I or, doubt it. Not big projects like that. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, even if they had the uh, you know, the qualifications for it, it would take up all their time. Like, for instance, I have a whole team of engineers working on Spanish Valley bike path right now, mm. like four or five guys. <laughs> so, I mean, it just even if they could do it, so they, they're never going to handle. They wouldn't have time. To do you're it. never going to handle all the engineering projects in no, the house. No. It's just too big a job. But this would take care of the, all the. A really important oversight. Yeah, planning and zoning related stuff. Mostly. Yeah. And if there's time and they have the qualifications for other things, yeah, that's fine. But, but you know, like we, you know, most of the time civil engineers, you know, can't do any kind of mechanical engineering or architecture or anything. Sure. Like yeah, right, right. It's very limited. <laughs> They're specialized usually. So what we'd be looking for is a, you know, an engineer that's specialized in subdivision, civil engineering, subdivision approval. Stuff like that. I mean, I think what we've seen this year with all the floods and all the problems with subdivisions and drainage in the town, I think that this position makes a lot of sense and that would, it would serve people. I, I totally agree. And also, I think there's everyone seems to express support for this. I, the county attorneys expressed a need for the engineer position a few times. We've, we've needed it's been discussed. Yeah. And they would be able to be a really great project manager on larger projects, even if we have to get bring in a team of engineers you know a professional engineer would be able to manage those projects better than anybody else that we have right now yeah so I, i'm supportive of this for sure i i definitely am supportive of the position oh the, the grade seemed i don't know 
Um, I just was curious about the compression in that office. Um, but if that seems like where it should be, then so be it. And that's not something we have it's to do. I mean, it's probably a little on the low side, but honestly, but a little on the which side? Low side, but. If we if we budget this under PNC, can we in the future if it looks like or later this year in the position to build, it looks like it would be a better fit somewhere else. Is that that would require an amendment outside of department? No, probably it's not moving money around. Oh, yeah, because yeah, it would stay in the general fund okay. more than so, likely. I mean, if we're moving from one department to another, the commission has to approve that. Right. But it doesn't require a public a public area. hearing unless you're increasing the yeah. total yeah. bottom line of the general fund. Yeah. Okay. And my argument would be also, even if we put it under PNC's budget, we can set up it in its own department, essentially, just pull the budget from there, but it can be kind of a... Uh, I mean, since we're just talking about, like, yeah, one position, I don't know that I can create a whole new department for it, but <clears throat> we need to have bigger discussions about the organizational structure, sure. but we can do that later. Yeah. Okay. And it would, you know, it's going to require like meeting with everybody um, and figuring out what the best structure is going to be well, that everyone has to buy. And I mean, there's been some a lot of friction in the past with this idea. Change mm -hmm. is hard. So it seems like this is unanimous consensus. Yeah. I hear any objections? Nope. Kevin, any thoughts on engineer? Um. Nope. Nothing to add. Great. Um, next up is the airport. Maybe we should do that one as a as a group. That sounds good. Um, let me scroll my structure right here. Uh, just as a reminder, this this change would be um taking away this operations manager not to hire a budget for it in 2023. Um, uh move the duties to these two specialist positions, call them lead operations tech, bump them up two grades because we're pretty much dividing this position in half. Um, and then adding that operations tech so that there's kind of an even number of, of people there to, to handle the 24 schedule, 24 seven scheduling that they need out at the airport. So I, I thought Tammy made a good case for this and it's close to budget neutral. So I think I would be in favor of it. Yeah, I think it's a wise use of resources. Tammy definitely made a good argument there. Con convincing argument for me. Yeah. Anyone have any objections to any of this? Awesome. Right. Too big on my screen. All right, that's all of it for new positions. We can move on to um, move on to reclassified positions and um, commission office coordinator. Uh, one grade increase for the increased uh, public communications duties. How much? How much money is that? Um, two thousand three hundred fifteen dollars. Uh, so, Mel, uh, go ahead, Kim. Um, so, okay, so, um, I mean, Mallory's not here to make the case for that, but when she did discuss it before, I, I thought it made sense. I know some people have disputed whether these duties are already in the job description or not, but um, Mallory thinks they weren't, and it's not a huge amount of money, um, and I, so I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I was one of those on the fence at first, and so had, had a bit of an email conversation with Mallory about it, but I, I I feel like I'm convinced on this one. I think it's good. It's not a lot of money, and I think it's good value for the money. I, I think adding this aspect would be very beneficial. I think it's something that we've needed for a long time. I'm I'm opposed to this. Um, not because I don't think that she's doing a great job, but um, because last year we restructured the whole office in order to increase capacity, and part of that was taking that position and making it full time and changing the title to coordinator and 
I do not think adding a little bit of communications work to that warrants a great change. And I was just looking at how commission admin office compares to the rest of the county. And I just think it's really important that we follow our, our protocols. I know that the commission admin office has our ear all the time, but other departments do not. And I think that we should reevaluate what grade for this position as we would any other in our like five year review, especially because we just changed it last year. We massively expanded it. We increased the grade a ton. Um, I would love for some communications to happen. And I don't think that a lot of overtime or extra work should be put onto this position. So, that's why I think it should just stay where it is at. You know, I, you know, one thing that come, came up when we were talking about form of government was, um, you know, the role of the, you know, the commission, you know, we're the executive of the county. So unlike the city, you know, we can, we can meddle in, you know, at any level of county government that we want to. But I, I think the consensus is, you know, we should let our managers manage and not get too into the details. And so I, for me, you know, if Mallory thinks it's a great increase, then unless there's a strong argument to the contrary, I'm inclined to go along with that. And I know that there are other, mm. other staff who thinks, you know, maybe this shouldn't be that way, or we should only review grades once every five years. Um, I, I am in favor of more flexibility than that. I, I don't think that kind of rigid rule serves as well. So I, I can, un I can understand the arguments people are making against doing this, but to me on balance and especially keeping in mind that, um, you know, this if for a relatively small amount of money, I'm I'm inclined to defer to, you know, Mallory on this. So. Oh, this was a hard. This is a hard one for me because I've seen the uh, the office just increase so much. It's really increased a lot. But after this last year, I think one of the things that's really hurting the county is we're not communicating the good works we're doing. People don't know what we're, we've been doing as far as like how we moved money to help with advertising once we became concerned, you know? So I think there's a dip, I think what we're doing in the county, you know, what we've done for affordable uninsured housing, what we've done for uh, things like that, no one knows about so it's really easy for them to go out there and say well grant county's done nothing to help with the housing situation because there's no we don't have anyone that's doing direct communication and it's it's hurting us it's getting we're getting a perception in the county that we're just elitists and we're not doing anything to help the people and partly because the stuff that we've done goes unreported and so as much as I, this is, this, I spent some time last night having a hard time going to sleep over this one because I do see the county's budget and this office has increased exponentially, yeah. much more than any other in the county. And that, that concerns me, the perception from the rest of the county concerns me. But at the same time, I see that not having good communication has really hurt us. That you know, it's really that people aren't seeing what we're doing to help the businesses in town. They're not seeing what we're doing. It's hard for the commission to make sure we get our uh, editorial in the newspaper so every so often. And if we had for two thousand dollars, if we could get that communication out and do a better job of letting the public know the good works we're doing, I'm. That, that's what convinced me to be okay with this position when I originally wasn't. Yeah. I really, originally, I was like, no, this office has grown too much. So I can. I mean, I completely agree with you, Mary. I think that we need to tackle that issue of communication. And I also think that after all of the efficiency changes that have happened in this office with all four employees in the commission administrator's office that 
without grade changes, we could try to figure that out. I mean, somebody should be able to write press releases and take take on these duties, but I don't know if just like increasing a grade is necessarily gonna give us that. I mean, I, I guess it's a restructuring of the job duties, but if there's that time already in order to take on more work, I think the grade is sufficiently high for that to happen. I'm with Sarah on that. I think it's a, a big part of it is prioritizing the duties within the existing position. So I think that everyone in the office is tasked with more than they're ever going to get done. And so it's just a matter of what you put on the top of the to do list. I think when we look at that grade compared to elsewhere in the county, um, I don't know. The, the office is starting to feel a little top heavy. You have any thoughts, Josie? You have a... <laughs> Wait, uh, I know it's hard. Yeah, no, I know. I think this one is really hard. And I um, I feel like I've had a hard time just finding some grounding to even look at this. So, I mean, I am kind of looking at some of the comparables. And I, I also just feel like I don't know as much about the minutia of the position as is or as proposed to really make these calls, but I do have the same kind of concerns. And I also just recognize through my own like discomfort of even debating it that like when we do have bases and ears that are in the chambers with us on a regular basis, it's it's much harder to right. Absolutely. You know, um, yeah. Say no or to like, like evaluate it. Yeah. It's a lot yeah. harder. Um, which isn't to say that that means you know the other thing, but um I, I'm not entirely convinced about the grade change either. Yeah, I must say. So I'll I'll just reiterate what I said before, and that you know we're, we're spending quite a bit of time on twenty three hundred dollars a year. There are things in the road department budget which you know I don't you know I don't know if they need a new street sweeper this year or they could wait a year or two. But I just take Bill Jackson. You know he's he's he recommends that, and I respect Bill's opinion on how to. Run the road department, so I go along with those things unless they're rather large or rather clearly, you know, out of line. Um, I think this is a a relatively small thing. Mallory seemed to feel strongly about it. Um, communicate, you know, better communications is definitely a priority of ours. Um, and communications can mean a pretty wide range of things. So it's to me, it's not necessarily just a small thing. You know, it could be a lot um, in terms of increased duties, but but mainly, you know, I, I though I can un, I understand you know the arguments on both sides, but to me the tiebreaker is, you know, the the head of the department wants to do this, and if you know, I, and so I need kind of a better reason to say nope, you know, sorry, we're not we're not going to do it, and I I don't I haven't heard that kind of good enough reason. Well, the issue that I have with that though is let's say we we extend that. Courtesy to all the departments across the whole county. That one. Well, but I think we are. Applying. Anything that, that anybody asked for that yet? Not it, not anything, but I I think you know when we get the road department budget, it does not you know we don't go over with a fine tooth comb. I mean, I well, think there's I, a very distinct difference though between changing salaries and any anything else in the budget, and I can tell you that it has. A greater effect on the sense of equity across the county at morale than anything else. And so, I mean, my suggestion is that in the near future, that we revise our policy on these things because we're violating our policy already. Um, and so, I think if you don't like that policy that we have in place, then we really need to address it, come up with a different policy that still is fair, you know. But also fiscally conservative and responsible. Because I just don't really feel like there's argument that whatever a department said, had says that we're just going to go with is a good philosophy. Uh, but th but that's not the argument. It's that other that what the department had wants you know weighs on this discussion. I think there's lots of other arguments that were, that were made, you know, independent of that, in favor and against that. But to me, if you know. Again, I, I, you know, I don't want to be micromanaging each department and, and, you know, second guessing even relatively small expenses. 
But well, yeah, I'm just saying it would be a small expense if it were extended across the whole county. And it's also a small expense, but it's a very high grade compared to other positions across the county. Well, maybe we should just have a vote on it. Okay. Because we're running out of time. Right. Yeah, we are running out of time. 3.35. So we need a motion before the vote. I don't like to make a negative motion, so. I I'll make a motion to approve the grade change for the commission office budget. Do I second that, Kevin? I'll, I'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? I think um, my opinion hasn't changed. So, and Trish weighed in on a few things through a text to me, but she didn't. She didn't mention anything about this. Just. So that's uh, there's six of us voting. I call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. If you say aye. Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. I, I, okay. All opposed. Okay. So the motion goes three three. So it fails. Right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, next up is Justice Court uh, changing the deputy. Oh, sorry. Um, next up is the program management change for uh, the jail admin associate assistant, um, adding in that 24 seven sobriety program um, and those increased duties as well as future programming out. Oh, and I just, oh, my hand out up there. Um, my computer just died, but. Um, <laughs> uh, Mm -hmm. Amy's is the $6,975 increase. Um, Chan spoke to that yesterday. I think Chan made a great argument yesterday, so I tend to go along with his recommendation. I think there's a lot more uh, duties that are in the water, and I like to have more programming options for the jail. Right. So I make a motion that we approve move to grade change to change the grade of the program manager and the admin admin assistant twenty four seven. Hello, Kevin. So Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> he has no idea. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mary made a motion to approve. Anyone want a second? Second. All right. Anyone else have a opinion on that? All in favor of approving? Okay, we can see you now, Kevin. <laughs> um, I so. took a picture before it died. So um, the last two were the uh, one individual grade increase for the two deputies within the justice court. Um, this was to match the, the current, um, or to match, the closest competitor, which is district court. Um, the cost on that was 2,700 and 2,300, so about 6,000 in total. Is that under the sheriff's budget? Um, that's under justice court, okay. so that okay. would be under Daniel's budget. So is this another one of the, the requests that is outside the process? Did we revisit these? Yeah, last we year? did last year and we equalized them with um, the other, the, a few of the other departments, like the clerk auditor's office, that have um, clerks in in her place. Well, at this point, though, you guys approved a new program that she has to go through since then. What was the program that was? This is uh, oh, this was not even this court? is the justice oh, court. Oh, sorry, I thought we were adding. So we already no. did that one. Yeah, yeah. we voted. Yeah, 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 this one's so, yeah, we've loved, I, yeah, our I think we have a lot. Of Fairly uh, we have a lot to uh, deal with with the budget and that court as it is. So we're going to have to look at it and figure out how to come into compliance and make sure we stay in compliance. So at this time, I, I am not comfortable uh, approving any additional funding. So we have to. So yeah, I'm not in favor. When would we be able to do that? 
don't know. Well, maybe I, before the budget comes out, you know, hopefully within the next. But I do think. Do what? I mean, think. Have, have a have a larger conversation about the justice court budget. Uh, yeah, we'll have to have a, a little workshop. Mm -hmm. So I I think we're premature on this. I think it needs to be looked at as a whole. Well, I think I mean. Regardless of the whole, if we revisited these grade changes and we looked across our entire county, which is based on multiple points out in the sector, that's that's our process and, and we did it. And now this request is comparing it to just one other point, which is the, the closest match in the district court. Um, I don't know. So I, I feel like we already did this and we're giving everyone likely a cost of living that's basically great increase so i'm i'm not in favor of the two requests with justice court great changes i'm, I'm with mary i think on this one i think it's part of a bigger conversation but isn't that other conversation just about a more narrow focus not the entire department's budget well, it's a narrow focus, but it's also something that's going to have to be figured out. And, and how are we going to figure that out? What are, where's, how are we going to give you the money and all of that stuff? Is, I just think it would be better to do it as a, as a larger Look at it. process. See how. I think you uh, so if we were going to look at it later, do we need the placeholder of like the requested amount and then we could whittle it down or could we add to it if we didn't accept the If we adopted a budget for the hearing, we can't make it bigger, can we? Okay. We just have to balance this um, So, I mean, that way, if you make it, Bigger than it may have drawn more out of fund balance. But if we want to revisit the justice court specifically, would you recommend that until we are able to workshop that, that we include the requests in the budget that's going to hearing, or do we leave them out and then have them later? Well, I have them plugged in right now, so I'm like taking things out as they get denied. So they're already in. The budget right now. Well, where are we on budget? Well, we haven't done that quarter well, yet. Well, so Cola's plugged in also. Good. We I, saved three quarters. But, uh, uh, so I'm also. Quarter, uh, so where are we on balance? So, so could, actually, could someone? I I think I missed the relevant part of the meeting yesterday because I I had to leave at four. But so the the current salaries were set based on some comparisons we made a couple of years ago, and now last year. Last year, okay, and now, but now Jan Lee is saying, "What about the district thing?" And so one side is saying, "We don't need to review them again because we just did it last year." And is that it for them? Well, I think the district courts may have gone up relative to these positions, and that's the justification. I guess my point though is that if we get a new data point, then we add it into all the other data points. We don't just use one data point ever to establish a- Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. We, um, I mean, what I would say is like, add, okay, fine, add those into the mix of the data that we use to see if it changes it. Kind of doubt that it will, quite honestly, but that it's just not the process that we use to establish grades for anybody. You know, we did one time in the past with the sheriff's deputies because we needed to compete with my city police department, but that's the only time I can ever remember where we used one single data point for. So, so I didn't. Is, is anyone in in favor of all the grade increases in this case? Anyone in favor? Not at this point. I'm not. Um, okay. So, do we just move on, or is there something else to be decided? Um, I guess to this thing that Evan asked is should we. Keep it as a placeholder. If, if we want to add this data point into the larger set and then reevaluate, what's the easiest point today to leave it in so, or take it, take it out and then risk adding it in later? I'm I'm fine either way if there's going to be a later revisitation of it. 
how do you hold it in without approving it? That's the question. Well, I think we want to stick with our same like technique that we're then progressing. So if you want it to come out of budget, you have to like vote to deny it and say that's the vote. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I uh, move to uh, remove deputy two and one from the budget today or the changes to deputy two and one, Justice Court. That capture. Yes. Yeah. Well, what was the total uh, at the next column over the total cost of the? It's about six thousand. Yeah. Added to and combined. It's combined. Six, yeah. Okay. It's not much. But. And the reason being the uh, methodology of coming to this number. Right. Give me one second. Okay. Any further discussion to remove? Motion to remove. All in favor? All right. Kevin? Yes. All right. Remove. Okay. Is that all of it? Yep. I don't think we need to do a vote on the uh, control deputies down there that were since we're cutting them, but just on there for. Those are the two positions we were. That yep. we worked out with. Okay. Great. All right, then. So I won't be able to make some of those changes immediately because I can't remember what everybody's existing salary is. So I'll, yeah. I'll hop in and if you could figure that out, I might be able to figure out what our bottom line is like right, right now. Yeah, the um, existing salaries, but let's uh, move. yeah, and not throw a curveball in. Okay. Uh, when we were working on the EMS budget, they did a 5% COLA, and they said the most recent uh, inflation rate was for 7.7. 7. Yeah. And I don't, I think that the high inflation is starting to drop. And I wonder if we want to just, you know, by judging what other organizations are doing with their COLA, um, if we want to look at that inflation rate. So, so in the past, we based it on what the feds are doing, right, Chris? Is that that's where we got the eight point seven? Because that, yeah, I mean, that is what they're seven came from the social security, social security right. adjustment, and um, can we do five point? I think seven point seven was like the most recent months. It's not the total drop across the whole annual rate. I don't think, but um, you could use a methodology either of you know trying to forecast what the average inflation rate costs. This year has been, which is one way we've done it, or go with the Social Security Administration's amendment. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things that Renee brought up, they were doing even more than eight. They're doing like 10% of some of those salaries, and some are doing eight because they're doing salary like, mm -hmm. classification. So it's kind of all over. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at this point, we're below the 800,000, so we hit the target already. But thank you. Uh, I was just bringing it up. I'm I'm all for a cola. I'm not trying to say to uh, move the cola. I not necessarily advocating for going as low as what EMS is doing, um, but I was more curious. If there's more current data than when we started working on the budget. You know, month month plus ago. It's a good question. It's a good question. So do you want to see if? Uh... You want to go then off? I mean, the amendment, the Social Security amendment said that deal. And so I haven't changed. Um, but the average annual inflation rate may have changed. I want, I think, but yeah, go ahead. I think perhaps uh, there has been a decrease in the nation. But in our travels, traveling, any of our traveling we're doing, it's like Grand County has the highest gas prices anywhere we've been. Oh, yeah. uh, our uh, our groceries are higher than any other town I've been in. So maybe the inflation rate has gone down for the nation, but I don't think it's starting to go down in Grand County. 
uh, undoubtedly yeah. Grant County has a higher inflation rate than the rest. No, I think of it, <laughs> but I mean, so I'm saying I would go with what yeah. Social Security. If we hit our target and we based the COLA on what the feds are doing in the past, I I feel pretty comfortable setting it at that. Great. So know. yeah, it dropped. Um, in yeah, October it dropped to seven point seven, but that's not the total. That's just inflation for that month. But the, the thing about, I mean, these numbers change depending on whether you're comparing July 2021 to July 2022 or September to September, and those fluctuate throughout the year. And so one has to just consistently pick a number each year. And I think the Social Security number is a good way to do that. I mean, they, they're they pretty careful with how they pick their number, and it represents you know inflate, inflation, at least nationally. And so I, I don't think we should try to second guess the Social Security number. If it, and if that's what we've been using in the past, which I think we have. In the recent past, I'm not, I can't say for sure that's how we bought that. I, can't remember. Yeah, I, mean, I, I remember a year where we were debating, should it be 2%? Should it be one? You know, and, and there wasn't a methodology. So so I am a fan of, of pegging it to something. And so if, if, the social, if the Social Security makes more sense, I just wanted to bring it up since it is the biggest call of it. I remember doing the last oh, eight years. Oh, they, they, they said in the feds, it's the biggest since what, 1982, I think. Yeah. I read. So that's far. 40 years. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I think it reflects reality. And I think when we're talking about equity also, I mean, a COLA is kind of the easiest way to give people more money just across the board equitably. So I'm not concerned that it being too high, especially if it is pegged. <laughs> Something that well, we're, usually, uh, we're still dealing with major problems here again with, with recruitment because mm -hmm. of high cost of the yeah yeah it's 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 it's, it's a problem you know, you know and it's been the case over the last few years that you know we've sent a grade and a staff to offer somebody and then through negotiation we can't get anybody coming we have to go back and try to increase the grade and then right. you know waive our step policy just to get people here so well it's uh it's 352, is this something we need to vote on? And this is this the last? Oh, one? yeah, I think we should make a vote okay. on the COLA. Don't want to make a motion on the COLA? I make a motion that we go with the rate, is it 8.3? 8.7 of the Social Security Connect for the Social Security Spine Out. I second that. Any other discussion? All right, all in favor of increasing the COLA or to 8.7 for next year? Yes. Okay. Then the next thing is I want to propose to just use the money that's already in capital projects fund to pay for next year's capital projects mm -hmm. instead of transferring from the general fund. And that, you know, is also a component of balancing the general fund's budget. Sounds, so is anybody object to that? Sounds wise. That sounds like it would end up there anyway. It is kind of sixes because right. the general fund money is what funds the capital project. <laughs> that sounds good, Chris. All right. All right. That's, I, I just got a, a view of myself in the giant screen. Sorry, <laughs> sorry you guys are having to look at that. I mean, I mean, it's large. Like that shot. Chalkboard. I thought that brings us as a chalkboard, not a whiteboard. All right, so here's a chalkboard. I hate whiteboards. I hate uh, awesome. It. Okay. And so I, I, I have a lot of loose ends to clean up, but yes. as soon as I get this ready, I'll send it out to everybody. Thank you. Chris. And we can still continue yeah. to make amendments right. after this, but it's just you know. And then we have more to, ten days to post it before the public hearing. Is that right? Yeah, I have to public get hearing it on, on the six. website. Everything okay. uh, by like the twenty fifth. Right, so by the, we'll have that done by the 25th of November. The public hearing will be on the 6th, 6th. and then potentially we'll pass the budget on the 20th. And so there's still opportunity on the 20th to like workshop again if you have last minute changes. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, <clears throat> it's best to try to get everything uh, okay. done as soon as possible. Okay, yeah. I will adjourn this uh, special workshop and we'll reconvene for the Thompson SSD meeting at 4 o'clock.
Hey, Gabe, can you give us a sound check? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you, Gabe. Okay. Uh, so we're good to go. Okay, I'll open. Uh, it's 4.03, November 15th. I'll open this regular... Uh, meeting of the Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District. Present are uh, Commissioners uh, Kovash, Clapper, Stock, McGann, and Hadler. In the chambers, we have Commissioner Kevin Walker on Zoom. We also have uh, Associate Administrator Quinn Hall, and we have Chief Markham on Zoom. Um, I will start with the citizens to be heard, and this is citizens to be heard for this uh, Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District to be heard for the regular commission, then we'll have a, another citizens to be heard in just a few minutes. Is there anyone who would like to be heard on Thompson? Anyone on Zoom? All right, I'll move to the uh, approval of meeting minutes for the last Thompson meeting. Did we have those? We don't have those. Okay. Okay, so we uh, motion to postpone. Second. All in favor of postponing. Okay. Uh passes six to nothing. We'll postpone to the next meeting. Um ratification of bills um for Thompson. Uh Total bills in the amount of $662.03. Total payroll in the amount of $1,646.88. Total bills and payroll in the amount of $2,308.91. So, Thanks, Mary. So moved. Second on the motion. All right. Um, all in favor of approving the Thompson bills, raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we are on to the chief's report, and it looks like uh, Chief Markham is with us on Zoom. Uh, you're up, Mark. Hey, hello. Um, recently, um, just had one incident between now and the last meeting. That was about a week ago. On the 8th, um, early morning, there was a car ran into the back of a semi-tractor trailer on I-70 at mile marker 197. Uh, equipment wise, still working on the issues with engine 21, trying to get that up and going again. I did order a uh, new extrication tools, basically the, uh, the jaws of life. And I'm hoping that'll be here within the next two weeks. I did apply for radios from the Utah Communications Authority for the new state communication system. Uh, this new system they have up and are putting on board is gonna be, uh, you need special types of radios to, to work with the system, to be able to communicate with other people. And um, we can get those at 10% of cost and they're, they're not cheap radios. So if we can get that deal to go through, that'd be great. Uh, that's a radio for the truck and also a handheld. Uh, training on October 26th, I did vehicle, extric vehicle extrication training with the Moab Valley Fire Department. Um, there's about an eight hour training. Most of it was hands-on cutting up cars and things like that. And it was, it was a great training. So I appreciate Moab Valley uh, including, including me with that. And then this past weekend, the 10th, 11th, and 12th, I was in Provo for a three-day uh, 
EMS training um, to keep my hours up as far as a, as an EMT. Uh, only other thing I have is the building. I did have to order some new parts for the station furnace and the bay heater. Um, hopefully those will be here this week and get those put in before it gets really cold. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, we're on to the uh, TSSD tentative budget. Um, is that you, Chris? It's, uh, me and Mark. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks guys. So yeah, I think this is gonna bring it up for you. All right, so we've got um, total revenue of 63695 Most of that is coming from Grant County. And we're using uh, TRT money for that. We are allowed to use TRT money for emergency services. So that's coming out of the mitigation side of uh, TRT. We also get a little bit of rent from the water district for the use of the building. Uh, let's scroll down a little to the expenditure side. We don't have to keep it. Yeah. So we've got the majority of the expense is going to be uh, salary and benefits for Mark. And uh, I'm going to scroll down a little more. A little, more. a little bit more. And then there we go. So then kind of the big increase uh, for this year is uh, we've got a number of um, kind of capital purchases and equipment maintenance and supplies. And maybe Mark can go over what that encapsulates. Okay, yeah. Um, so the capital equipment um, actually is gonna be for this year. I thought, I thought we'd work, we'll be able to work that out, Chris, with the extrication equipment. Um, that's gonna be $8,000. Um, the other expenses, the things that went up, um, as far as next year goes is uh, travel. Um, basically that, that's just fuel. And with the fuel prices this year and some longer distance calls, um, that cost went up. So I'm um, projecting about $1,200 for next year, which is up and above this year's costs. As far as equipment goes, um, let's see, looks like we've got about 17,000 for next year, 17,600. 5,000 of that is gonna be for our big engine, engine 41. It's due, it's actually a year overdue for a general uh, service and maintenance from the manufacturer. I'm gonna have to take it up to Salt Lake uh, just to get everything checked out and uh, uh, do a, a big time service on that and just make sure it's ready to go for another five to 10 years. At least um, $10,000 was for engine 21 to either get that fixed or I have also applied to the state for a, uh, a basically excess property. So they have old military vehicles or older military vehicles um, or forest service vehicles that I could replace engine 21 with, but that it needs to be replaced because that's a four wheel drive, uh, all purpose EMS, fire rescue, wildland fire truck. Um, the big engine, obviously it can't go off road because it's a, it's made for pavement. It's a mostly highway and, and local call kind of thing. And then uh, I did have $600 in there for um, a gas monitor or for gas monitor. Uh, propane leaks, carbon monoxide, that kind of thing. Um, really, really important when we have an incident like that out there to uh, to jump on that and make sure we know what we got. And then uh, another two thousand dollars on top of that for uh, just general equipment purchases for next year. And uh, I think that's all the increases I had for next year, unless I'm missing something there, Chris. No, I don't think so. Pretty simple. <laughs> Anybody have any questions about it? Any questions yeah, just, just like with the uh, uh, with the with the county's budget, we have to adopt a tenant. Tenant, right? And then we're planning on having the public hearing for this on the sixth, also. Okay. And scheduling again to approve this budget on the twentieth. So this is the tentative budget. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yes, Kevin or uh, Evan. I'm sorry. I would move to adopt the tentative 2023 Thompson Springs Special Service District budget. Thank you. Second. All right, I have a motion by Evan and a second by Mary. Any other discussion on the tentative budget? And again, they would, would follow the same procedure where we'd have a uh, public hearing on the six, you said. Yes. Excellent, okay. All right, all those in favor of adopting the budget, raise your hand. Kevin? I don't see Kevin. 
I'll just call that passes five to nothing with Kevin and Trish absent. All okay. right. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It doesn't look like we have any other Thompson business, so I will adjourn the uh, Thompson Springs Special Fire, Special Service Fire District uh, at this time. And I will open the regular uh, November 15th Grand County Commission meeting uh, with the same folks present as at the Thompson Fire District. All right. We will uh, go to Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and in the soul, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We will have our regular. Uh, Mission citizens to be heard at this point. Um, looks like there's a few people in the chambers. So if any of you are here to uh, be heard, you can come up and please sit at the table and speak into the mic and you'll have uh, three minutes to speak. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Goldsmith. This is my wife, Gretchen. We're here to talk about the Rancho Nuevo subdivision and we have others from our community that are here and they'd like to cede their time. Is that possible? So allow me to give a speak, speak for the whole group. To speak for the whole group. There'll be two shorter presentations after mine, but mine is gonna take into account the issues that we've all experienced. Oh, okay, how long do you expect to be speaking? About 13 minutes. Um, oh, th th he said 13, That that's a bit beyond the scope of what we generally, um, have first citizens be heard. I, I know we've gotten a lot of correspondence from, from okay. you all as well. Well, I can try to give a top level summary then, and we can present you with the full presentation for you to, to read afterwards. Would that work? Um, how do you guys feel about that? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five people. That's 10 minutes. And then those that, um, makes 12. Right. I would be comfortable with 13 minutes. Okay. okay. I, I am as well, so <laughs> sorry, get, go ahead. Okay, and I'll apologize in advance. I have exercise-induced asthma, and this apparently is an exercise because I'm having trouble breathing. Um, <clears throat> Gretchen and I live at 2745 Nuevo Court. That's lot three in the Rancho Nuevo subdivision. We and the other lot owners in the Rancho Nuevo subdivision are here this afternoon to ask the county to bear the costs required for us to rectify the major defects in our stormwater management system. As you may have heard, we've had storm water flow into our garages and crawl spaces, the unwelcome terraforming of our driveways and lots, and mud and other debris deposited on concrete and other surfaces as a result of the storm water management in our subdivision. Exacerbating these problems are our retention ponds have overflowed onto each other's properties during the storms of August and October. Gretchen's going to hand you a binder that has some photos that show what happened on our lot, but the story is very similar for most of us in the subdivision. You'll see water pouring onto our property from our higher neighbor, um, water flowing out of their retention pond spillways. You'll see water accumulated in our driveway in the space between our house and garage and on the side of our garage, and ultimately water entering our garage and our crawl space. <clears throat> the defects in the stormwater management system that caused those things to occur are not the fault of any of the individual homeowners who bought into the subdivision, but rather are the fault of the county and its detrimental reliance on the actions and inactions of its county contract engineer, Dave Dillman, and building inspector, Bill Hulse, as I will outline in the next few minutes. That's on September 9th, we filed a grammar request for all documentation related to stormwater management in our subdivision. Reading through the 300 documents was really eye-opening. The developer constantly had to be pushed to do the right thing and to correct things that had repeatedly done wrong. We have heard the same thing from almost everyone that we have talked to since and since and before moving into the subdivision, from county workers to utility company employees to general contractors, all report the same, that it was held, that the developer ignored all manner of professional guidance and ultimately did whatever it wanted and poorly so. And alarmingly, that it was allowed by the county to get away with things that other builder, builders in the county are not allowed to get away with. It was also easy to discern from the numerous emails that I read that toward the end of the development process, the county became exhausted with the whole process. 
In one email, a county employee went so far as to label the Rancho Nuevo LLC as a hack developer. Unfortunately, the county's exasperation occurred at exactly the wrong time in the process when there was so much critical work yet to be done and, and redone under the supervision of the county. Where it was the, whereas there was all manner of documentation during the planning and development stage of the subdivision, including photo documentation, there was a sharp drop off toward the end. In fact, there are no photos document there are next to no photos documenting the state of development in the time of final approval. How is that possible? I will get back to the documentation shortly. Having suffered along with other homeowners in this subdivision with the torrential rains of the August storms, we, request, we requested an inspection by the county of our lot. On September 6, the county contract engineer, Dave Dillman, and Bill Jackson came out and met with my wife and I. One of Dave, Dave Dillman's first remarks to us was that the entire development did not look like it did when final approval was given. That was a shocking revelation, so we felt compelled to follow up with questions. When asked why our yards are graded toward our homes and shown that storm water must travel uphill to reach our retention ponds, Dave Dillman blamed the developer. When asked where the vegetative mats are in our retention pond on the downhill side, as specified in the Rancho Nuevo drainage plan, which Gretchen will hand out a copy of, Dave Dillman said that there are, they are in the spillways. Mind you, spillways are not specified in the drainage plan, but the need for vegetative mats on the downhill side to prevent erosion are. When shown the drainage plan and the fact that no spillways are specified on any of the lots, Dave Dillman was silent. When shown and asked about the severe erosion that exists on the downhill slopes of the retention ponds due to the absence of these vegetative mats, Dave Dillman responded that the erosion is to be expected and that it can be seen throughout the county. When asked if he would have permitted construction debris in and around the retention ponds during final inspection, Dave Dillman responded no. When shown and asked about the cement and rebar sticking up from incorpor and incorporated fully into our retention pond and the surrounding areas, Dave Dillman denied that it could have possibly been there when he approved the development as he would have tripped over it. I'll come back to that later. There are photos in the binder that show rebar, cement, and other debris in and around our retention pond. These items were there when we bought the house one year ago. The rebar extends so far into the ground that you cannot simply pull it up to remove it, i.e. it wasn't, wasn't added afterwards. And you can't walk the length of a retention pond without noticing all this debris. When shown that a retention pond extends 10 feet onto our neighbor's property, Dave Dillman was again silent. When shown where our retention pond overflowed during the August 20th storm, Dave Dillman was silent. This is critical as there was to be no overflow onto adjacent properties and certainly none onto our lower neighbors along Pack Creek, but there absolutely was. Surprisingly, two weeks later, we received a follow-up letter from the county's code enforcement office in which Dave Dillman was quoted to have said, quote, Water levels in the retention pond did not fill the pond and no signs of water flowing over the emergency spillway was observed, end quote. It was maddening to read that and it goes without saying that this was clearly a case of someone protecting themselves from possible subsequent scrutiny and criticism. The signs of water flowing out and over our retention pond were plainly visible on September 6th. Were that not sufficient evidence, we also have photographic and videographic evidence that we took during the storm of August 20th. When shown the photographic evidence of how our uphill neighbor's retention pond flowed onto our property through its spillway, Dave Dillman was silent. And finally, when shown the property lines and that the back wall of our uphill neighbor's retention pond is actually fully on our property, Dave Dillman was again silent. It's noteworthy that each of these retention ponds were purportedly over-engineered to contain the volume of water associated with a 100-year storm event. They absolutely did not, overfilling within just 20 minutes of the August and October storms of this year. Additionally, as specified in county guidance documents, the water in our retention ponds is supposed to be absorbed by the soil within three hours. That is the only mechanism for water removal from our ponds. That is also not the case. Any water not making its way through the spillways is retained for days, making storms on consecutive days entirely unmanageable. Clearly, the soils in this development were never properly evaluated by the county. It is frightening to imagine how much worse it would have been had our crawl spaces not acted as retention ponds and taken up the majority of the water that moved across our properties. That is certainly not the intended function of our crawl spaces, but thanks to the county, they were forced to act as retention ponds. I would like to point out that any water flow off our property and the adjacent properties to ours runs directly into Sherry Griffith's property. 
in the grandma request records, it was incredible and extremely sad to see how tirelessly she and others had to fight to protect their properties from the mismanagement of this development's strong stormwater management systems. Ultimately, I believe the county has allowed their worst nightmares to come true. The, mass, the vast majority of water that filled our retention pond during the August 20th storm reached it via the French drain that spans the width of our driveway apron, which was overrun within minutes of the storm's downpour, and via the gutters coming off the back of our home and garage, whose outpourings flow in channels that I personally dug into the dirt toward our retention pond since water will not travel uphill. Were all the water coming onto our property to have been directed into our retention pond instead of our crawl space, Sherry Griff's property would have received a much larger torrent of water. And had the water from lots two, four, and five similarly reached and breached their retention ponds instead of filling their crawl spaces, this torrent would have been a tsunami of water and mud as the water flow would have destabilized the steep hillside between our homes and hers. Rather than take responsibility for the many failures in the Rancho de Huevo stormwater management that are obvious to even the most untrained eyes, Dave Dillman instead would have us all believe that after receiving final sign off from the county, the developer who all along had to be coaxed to do anything correctly would suddenly waste time, money, and resources to entirely change the face of the development. <clears throat> bringing in truckloads of dirt and grading it all towards the homes and garages, changing the, gra the grading behind the structures so that water would not flow toward the retention ponds, but instead be directed into our crawl spaces and re-engineering the retention pond themselves. In the case of our retention pond specifically, that re-engineering would include introducing considerable construction debris into both its walls and bottom and extending the pond more than 10 feet onto our neighbor's property. To believe that this developer would have done any of that is just pure fantasy. Even if one does accept all this fantasy is the truth, the cross space vents that exist on both sides of our homes are clearly below the soil level, which allows storm water to flow directly into our cross spaces. This is a defect that should never have been passed inspection by the county building inspector, Bill House, were he to have bothered to show up and perform his duties. At this point, you may very well think that this is just a case of he said, she said, and that no one is clearly to blame. If so, I would ask that you please reference the March 31st, 2021 email from Dave Zillman. It'll be on the second page of what Gretchen's about to hand out. This email was to from Dave Dillman to Bill House, Bill Jackson, and Russell Seeley from the state of uh, Utah, I say Ohio, regarding the final inspection of the Rancho in the Way of Subdivision. In it, you'll see that Dave shares a list of his concerns regarding our subdivision specifically listed the following. One, retention basins adequate size and finished. Two, erosion control mat required in all downstream, downstream slopes of basins. Three, grading away from buildings per building code requirements. Four, all drainage for each lot must be directed into the lot retention pond. And five, concern that driveways are graded so the flow does not run into garages. In the documents I received, in response to our grammar request, there is nothing to suggest that these issues were ever addressed, and there is no final building inspection indicating that these issues were rectified and signed off on. What we do know is that the five concerns that Dave Dillman enumerated are the exact same problems that still exist today, 17 months later, and are the very same issues that have negatively affected us and bring us here today. Obviously, these major defects were never corrected, yet the county presumably signed off on the development allowing the developer to wash its hands of it and us. How is this possible and how is this fair to the unsuspecting families who would soon after buy into the subdivision? One explanation as to how it was possible may be provided in the email that's on the front of what was just handed out. In that email, Abby Scott writes to Dave Dillman, Bill Hulse, and Bill Jackson, and she writes, hi, Bill. It's not clear from reading it which bill she intended to be addressing, but she proceeds to convey to that bill that Dave Dillman has requested that Bill perform the final inspection of the Draven drainage infrastructure in order for the planning and zoning signature on the developer's certificates of occupancy. Abby also informs Bill that Dave Dillman had a list of items that needed to be finished prior to final approval, which Abby states she thinks Bill may have as well. From the records that I was provided, only one of the two bills responded, and it was not the one you would expect. Only Bill Jackson responded to Abby with, will do, thanks. This is incredible. For anyone unfamiliar, Bill Jackson is the roads and bridge supervisor. And for the record, there are no roads or bridges in the Rancho Nuevo Stormwater Management Plan. 
Are we in this colossal mess because Dave Dillman improperly delegated his duties to someone who is unqualified, unfamiliar with the issues, possibly entirely unprepared, and very likely disinterested in performing Dave Dillman's duties? It certainly appears so. More than a little disingenuous of Dave Dillman to say that he would have tripped over debris in our retention pond when he was not even there for the final inspection. Does the Horrox contract allow for the final inspection to be passed off to a non Horrox engineer employee? And what could possibly have prevented Bill Hulse from doing his job? We would very, very much like to see who signed off on the approval documents. In conclusion, the individuals who purchased these eight properties over the last year were left with the consequences of the county's monumental errors in managing the development of the subdivision, the magnitude of which was only wholly revealed to us during the August and October storms of this year. Rest assured, we have turned to the developer for help with stormwater management issues on our lots, both before and after our purchase, and after the August storms in particular, but have been met with silence or being told the same thing repeatedly, that the county approved it all and has signed off on it, and therefore no improvements will be made. On this point, the developer is absolutely correct. The county approved this disastrous mess and now has the oblig obligation to right this wrong. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I that's right. Yeah. Okay, Sarah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> My name is Sarah Pinocchio. I own 2771 New Wave Court, Block 5. And I'm passing out a copy of my presentation and the emails that I've sent in the past. I know you have all received my emails, and I hope you understand how serious this situation is in our development. So many things on my home were not done to code, and the county approved a complete mess on this development of eight brand new homes and made the homeowners pay the price for the county's negligence. The county failed us and needs to take responsibility for what happened in this development. The only people you have sent to our homes are the same people who approved the incorrect work that was done, and it has been so obvious that they are only interested in protecting themselves instead of taking responsibility for them not doing their jobs. I emailed all of you because I'm not interested in working or talking to these employees who completely failed at doing their jobs. I emailed you because whoever is in charge of these employees needs to take on the responsibility for what happened, and I can only assume that that's all of you. With all the emails we have got from the grammar request, it's obvious the county struggled to hold the contractor and developer accountable to do things right. You know how you hold them accountable? You don't give them the COs, and the COs should have never been given on these homes. When I met with Bill Hulse on my property before I purchased it back in May and pointed out all the things that were wrong on my home, he continuously said how easy it would be for me to fix the issues. Telling, tell me when it has ever been a standard to let contractors do a half-assed job on a newly constructed home and make the homeowners fix all the things that were not done correctly, when? Tell me when it became a standard in this county. I'm not a builder. It was the builder's responsibility to do it correct in the first place. Bill said, and I quote, we let them do it to a construction grade, knowing the homeowners would have to do it to a finished grade. What? When was that disclosed? And when has that ever been allowed? Again, homeowners are not builders. Why would you make a homeowner on a brand new home have to rip out and repair nonstop issues because the county felt bad for a builder who didn't know what they were doing? Not only that, you also allowed the same developer to just break ground on a new development in Moab, the Desert Soul subdivision. Are you planning on letting this out-of-town developer screw those homeowners over too? The hardware store has become my second home now. This is just a few of my receipts. I'm in the tens of thousands of dollars chasing and fixing all the issues that exist on my home because of the county's negligence. I have been fighting these issues since the day I moved in back in June. I have been trying to fix my house for six months now, and the time and energy and money has been immensely overwhelming. I have been neglecting my own business. I have spent countless hours trying to fix my property. 
I am not a general contractor. And I have been given discounts to my contracting clients to get advice on how to fix the issues that exist on my home. I have been straining my friendships to get house, help chasing every issue every week. I don't think you understand how overwhelming and stressful this has been. We didn't even have a leg to stand on with the developer because the county signed off on the shoddy work. So he says, you guys said he did it correctly when in fact it was not. The county is responsible for this failure and the county, sorry, and the county is supposed to protect us. The county is supposed to make sure things are done correctly. And the failures on this development was approved by Grand County. I thought you worked for us, not the general contractors or the developers. You work for us to protect us and the county failed us. I will be submitting timelines before and after photos and my labor material and all the costs associated with the with what Grand County approved that was not to code and what the developer should have been responsible for in the first place. I will expect full reimbursement by Grand County. If what your employees told us is true when they met with us a month or so ago and none of the issues existed when they approved this development, then the county can use their own legal team to go after the developer for reimbursement for what they, you've had to pay out to us. That burden is on the county because I think we all know your, your employees are lying to cover their negligence and the emails we received from the grandma request prove it. This development of eight homes was approved by Grand County with no concern for the homeowners. And now the county needs to do the right thing and take on the responsibility to do right by the homeowners you felt. Thank you, sir. I need to sit. Yes, Right. Um, I'm Trista, Trista Winder. Uh, my husband and I own Bike Fiend here in Moab. We just moved here ooh, last year um, and bought our home in Rancho Nuevo Court. I'm 2765, lot number four. Um, want to thank you very much for your time, for this space, for us to be heard. I think that's probably one of the most valuable things being in the situation that we're in is to be heard. You already heard all the details. There's water in my crawl space. There's um, my retention pond failed. My neighbor's retention pond failed above us. Um, most of all, you can tell there's a lot of feelings of frustration, <laughs> anger, definitely anger, and a little disheartening, um, sometimes despair, but mostly <sighs> sad, right? Like. All of us have a need for a home, for shelter, for confidence that your home is going to function when it rains outside. I've never been in that position where it's raining and I'm just scared. Like the last time it rained in October, my husband and I were out digging ditches to get the water. We just have a massive pool on our cement and we're watching it drain into our crawl space. So we just started digging trenches, which by the way is really hard when it rains because you can't see how far you're digging. And sometimes you dig too deep and then not deep enough. And anyways, eventually we got it to all drain. Um, the point being is all of us do have a need for this security and definitely finances. I left my business of 15 years in Salt Lake to come down here, started grad school in January. Um, love doing the bike shop. We've had an immense amount of mentorship and community showing up here in Moab, which I'm very grateful for and want to stay. Um, and financially, it would be a huge help if the county could help or reimburse we brought in an excavator because we're not interested in incurring more damage to our home what's happening underneath it um the foundation so we have somebody currently excavating the property um i know that my expenses are it, it's it's climbing so it would be a huge help to have the county reimburse us for the flood management in our property um and I think that's all that I have. I'm very grateful for the time to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come up and say anything? 
All right. Yeah. Thank thank you all for coming down. And I'm very sorry for what you all are going through. And I think we need to do some follow up yeah. and either organize a meeting with you know our staff and figure out what we how we can move forward in a way that you know I don't know what we can do, but we will we will definitely work on this, find out what's happening. Yes. Um, do you want do you want to come forward so you can just just so the mic can record you? Hi, I'm Gretchen Goldsmith, and I just wanted to say um, the county officials told us we should neighbor to neighbor make a civil matter out of fixing the retention ponds um, because the front row of people are just their water's just coming down. The street water is coming down into our property. So the county road is is sending water our way. Um, we we love our neighbors. We've come, we've grown closer together as a result of the hell we've been through with water. And this is not about the 100 year flood. We wanted to make sure you understand anytime the sky is gray and water drops, we freak out. We are anxious. We can't feel safe in our homes. We're digging ditches while there's lightning and thunder going on outside with metal tools. Envision that. Um, our neighbors are in the front row are kind of bristling at us because of the the, the person that we have coming in to rectify or try to preserve the safety of our homes. And it's already causing some friction. So we want to love our neighbors because that's what brought us to Moab. Locals love locals, right? We respect each other. So your help would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to uh, come forward and be heard? Do we have anyone on our uh, Zoom who would like to make a uh, public comment? All right, doesn't look like it. All right, we'll move on to, let's see, it doesn't look like we have a presentation. So department reports, uh, Sand Flats Recreation Area Annual Report. I would assume that's Andrea. Hi. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Let me share my screen to do my presentation. Are you really on the beach? <laughs> no, that's actually at uh, Ken's Lake. And uh, for um, uh, with the lake frozen. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm just going to do a quick little background. Um, okay. So uh, the San Flats Recreation Area, of course, is managed in partnership between the Bureau of Land Management and the county. Um, the Slick Rock Bike Trail was the first national recreation trail in Utah. And um, we, of course, are known for our challenging four by four trails. Uh, recently, the BLM has applied for national recreation trail designation for Howl's Revenge. Um, so that's just starting to happen. And uh, hopefully we'll get that designation. And of course, we're also known for uh, non-motorized and motorized working together and visiting the area. We also have over 140 campsites that are full in the spring and the fall. And as I said, it's managed in partnership. It's self-sustaining entity and an enterprise fund under the county. And the budget is used exclusively from, uh, it's come from exclusively from our collected fee monies. And uh, we've actually, let me just, I didn't change that, but 2022, uh, we will complete our 24th year of uh, self-sustained operation. And our mission, of course, is to ensure the outstanding natural features of the area are protected, provide sustainable public opportunities for recreation opportunities, public safety, reduction of visitor conflict, and economic, positive economic benefits to the county. And both the BLM and Grand County utilize their combined resources and authority to cooperate and improve conditions within the San Flats Recreation Area to serve the public. And, uh, whereby the users of the area fund the management and protection and service of the area. 
Uh, back um, a few years ago, Sam Flats was chosen as the poster child uh, for county, uh, or I should say for local, in this case, county, of course, and the federal government working together to manage public lands. And just as an overview, uh, we have um, over 250,000 visitors now with the special recreation permits and uh, private users and events. Uh, our entrance station is staffed February through November. Um, we have self-pay station when the entrance station is closed. People can also purchase day use passes online. We have nine trailheads, 45 miles of trails, 30 interpretive kiosks and nine feet campgrounds with the 140 sites and six group sites. And you can see we have like 28 toilets and um, over 30 interpretive kiosks. This was done a few years ago by the BLM, but uh, at that time um, it was over $12 million was uh, the economic value of the public lands at Sam Flats to Grand County. And hopefully they'll do this study again um, soon so we can get an update. Uh, so I like to um, compare our uh, data of our revenue with 2019 be still because of uh, COVID. And so uh, we were down 12% this year compared to last year, but we were up 6% compared to 2019. And I think I'm uh, with Kevin Walker in uh, feeling that uh, 2019 is a better baseline to compare things to. And uh, these are our current amenity fees. Um, I will be coming, you might recall from uh, about this time last year, you did approve some changes in the fees and uh, these will go into effect uh, after further approval in 2023. And uh, that is to drop the $5 day use fee and have just the week fee available for $10 and uh, $5 for bicycles and uh, motorcycles for the week. So our day-to-day -day operations include staffing the entrance station. We have four full-time staff, four to six seasonal staff in the spring and the fall. And then this year, uh, in 2023, we will have high school apprentices again. We haven't had them because of COVID for the last few years. So the entrance station has fee collection, orientation, uh, safety information for our visitors. We maintain our trailheads daily. We make front country and back country patrols to provide security and information and to uh, take care of maintenance in the front country and back country to protect the resource and uh, provide direction to the users. And we also do trailside restoration work. And of course, trash removal and taking care of toilets is a big part of uh, where our budget goes. And our many kiosks and signs and brochures. And then we have, as I said, our apprenticeship program will start up again next year. Uh, we also provide $10,000 a year to search and rescue. And uh, to date, we've uh, provided over $295,000 to, to them. So for 2022, some highlights. Uh, we had another uh, BLM Outfitter Sam Flats Workday back in February, working on Hell's Revenge Trail, blocking off illegal routes. Um, we did, uh, the, the BLM did approve uh, Motorized Trail Committee's proposals from a few years ago, they were finally approved uh, in time for spring of this year. And so they were open before Jeep Safari. And the main one, can you see my cursor on the screen or not? I don't know. The main one was from a uh, staircase, you, um, which this route goes from tip over to toward the abyss. It used to just be a motorcycle and bicycle route. It's shown as an eight and a seven on this uh, map. And that is now open to all vehicles. And the obstacle is called the staircase. It does have bypass where you see the seven or the main obstacle is to continue on the eight um, trail there, number eight trail. And so uh, this, uh, as I said, this uh, their nine of their 11 proposals were approved. We uh, got our signs up before Jeep Safari and um, people are, are really enjoying that trail. Another thing that happened this spring is we had another volunteer day with the BLM and the company um, uh, Stellantis, which, which includes Jeep 
and um, the Bureau of Land Management and Sam Flats and installed a pretty major fence out on uh, the Fins and Things Trail. Um, we also had our community volunteer days in the spring and the fall to commemorate in the fall the Public Lands Day. And then uh, you might recall that you folks approved, um, you know, as far as the education component, uh, one of the things we have is those videos on Channel 6. You folks approved those the last two years. And then this year, we also worked with uh, filmmaker Mark Finley of Finley Holiday, again, um, well, assisting him, actually. These were funded by the Travel Council, but we assisted with location and information and uh, on the biological soil crust uh, video that is out now, uh, Moab's Living Soils. <clears throat> and also, he um, has been working on ephemeral pool video, which will be out next year for Travel Council. And we assisted him with, with locations for that and, and uh, labor. And these are just some blow up uh, photos of some of the critters in those potholes at Sam Flats and other places. Um, some continued highlights, uh, as you know, we worked on uh, HB 180, the OHB online test that'll go into effect in January of 2023. That was with the uh, Grand County Attorney, Commissioners and Travel Council and uh, Grand County Active Trails and Transportation to develop the educational content, the questions and to edit Sam Plot's five tips for an awesome web adventure video into uh, three smaller videos to be used on the online test. Uh, our bigger construction project this year was to uh, complete an expansion of the parking lot that is at the corner of Potato Salad Hill Road or Old Dump Road and the Sam Plot's Road. And so that construction started in February with Harrison's Oil Company got that. And uh, this is the parking lot. And then when we, we were able to, I was able to acquire boulders from the solid waste district from just up there near the dump. And uh, that, was, that was great that they gave those to us. And, um, and then we had it seated. We had the bank seated. And then we had quite a bit of fill that came out of there. So some of it was uh, put in at the uh, baby lion's back to fill that in so that it would be a smoother entrance to that. And, uh, and then there was a few bumps, uh, I should say a few ditches, few issues with the culverts. So we had to go back, um, Bill Jackson and myself and the engineer and the, and the contractor and clean those up. We needed to have boxes added and a culvert in the middle there between the egress and ingress. And so those were paved um, in June. And then uh, there was an issue with the culvert being too high. We were able to uh, have that addressed by the contractor and then um, uh, you can see it in use right now. So it was in use for Jeep Safari, but the egress and ingress and the culverts weren't fixed until uh, the summer. Um, you may already know that Hawks Glide Trail opened um, officially today and uh, that's up above Porcupine Rim Trailhead comes into the Porcupine Rim Trailhead. So we worked um, some with active trail and transportation over the years on the layout for that. And we're happy that that is now open. Um, the lower part of the Raptor route is uh, the Kestrel route. We worked with them this summer on a um, botany survey and uh, also picking some locations for that. And um, that will uh, be worked on in the spring. Um, the lower section. And what this lower section will do is it will make it so people can go from Falcon Flow, a parking lot, the lower parking lot, and not have to use the Sand Flats Road to get through Days Crack. They'll go around that on this lower Raptor route, the Kestrel Trail, and it'll come out in uh, Campground H. And I'm sorry, I do have a map here. So it's the pink one on this map. And the Falcon Flow parking lot's on the right side here. And so it'll go across. Um, on the uh, north side of the road and then cross over where the pinion trail is and then go down. And this will be uh, very important for safety for um, the mountain bikers. And then we continued uh, to work on our International Dark Sky Park application. Um, we held some, or tried to hold <laughs> some star parties this summer, but there was a lot of rain. So um, some of them worked out and some of them didn't. Uh, we did install some new lighting at the booth um, to, to work to make it dark sky compliant. Um, those just went up and we just had our toilets repainted inside and out at Slick Rock and um, Hell's Revenge by our contractor. 
And so uh, it was time to get that done and they look good. And then just to mention with all the flooding, we did have some road damage and uh, kudos to the road department for coming up there and fixing this one area twice, three weeks apart. Um, as you may recall, we are still trying to um, acquire funding eventually um, for the Samplots Road to either pave it, well, two to seven miles up the road and have bike lanes on either side. Uh, the flap grant would be the best funding, but that doesn't open again until 2025. Um, we did put in for a raise grant twice and we will put in again next April. Um, well, Jones and the mill handles that for us. And then something that'll be happening this winter is we'll be working with Active Trails and Transportation and Travel Council on um, the Wander app that the uh, county uh, has uh, acquired, I mean, has one through um, Travel Council, has a new app through Wander app, and that will be um, hopefully a go-to place for everybody coming to Moab so they can get really good information on maps and trails. Uh, there's a lot of different ones out there and there's a lot of misinformation. So we're trying to come together and also work with the Bureau of Land Management to, to correct that. And then just last week, I was out on Hell's Revenge with uh, the BLM and Motorized Trail Committee and At Your Leisure was out there filming uh, on the trail. They wanted to showcase the staircase um, new route and more uh, importantly, the partnership between the Motorized Trail Committee volunteers and the land managers. And um, so it was, it was a great day out there and that will air on Saturday, November 26th at your leisure. And then I completed the business plan this week. Um, again, this is for the fee change. It'll go to the rack board um, in January, I'll present to them and the fee should go into effect in February. I will be coming back to the commission in December um, at uh, Evan Clapper's um, prompting in March of last year, after your approval in December, he suggested that we drop our trailer fee um, because we want to encourage trailering and not discourage it. And our trailer fee uh, partially does that. So I'm gonna be back before you in December to get your approval to drop our trailer fee, which will reduce our income about 40,000, but we will make it back up with the changes you approved last December. And uh, in summary, a successful partnerships up at, between Grand County and the BLM and others, uh, self-sustainability, our visitation continues to increase and we make our improvements with our fee monies, our grants and through our BLM partnership. Any questions? Mary? Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you. Great, great presentation, Andrea. And appreciate what you do up there. It's I, I love recreating in sand flats. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Uh, we are to our next department report. Um, Rose Department with Bill Jackson. Welcome, Bill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. No picture presentation. Oh. <laughs> I hope to paint a picture, though. Andrew's a tough act to follow. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to start off with uh, giving kudos to my staff. Um, there's been some, in 2021, uh, you know, the difficult situation with the burn scar and the flooding, and we were shorthanded, and and uh, I think everybody stepped up really well and not only handled the, some of the aftermath of that, but continued on, uh, you know, taking care of business throughout the whole county. As you know, we, we have uh, 1,500 miles of, of road that we maintain um, and all the associated uh, infrastructure with that, including bridges and signs and cow guards and you know, culverts and you name it. We, we've got a lot of infrastructure and I got a list here. I can give you almost a, a count of every one of them that we don't have that much time. So, so we're pretty busy. Um, like I said, in 2021, we were short staffed. Um, we've since uh, restaffed up in 2022. Um, so, and 
so that's been a good deal. Our level of service, I believe, is uh, starting to pick back up, of course. 2022 sent us uh, some challenges as well with flooding, and a lot of our concentration has been on, on uh, cleanup. Um, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but in 2021, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, in my in the office, and particularly I'll just say myself, uh, in planning uh, uh, with uh, the planning and zoning department, but in particular we the the unified transportation master plan. I was co-manager of that as well with the, with Chuck Williams of the city, and uh, Kimley Horn was our consultant, and you all uh, approved that this year. Appreciate that. I think it's a good plan. Um, with that plan, we've sent out an application through Kim Lynn Horn uh, for grant money uh, through the Safe Streets for All. And uh, we're hoping we can get that, find out what, what the result of that is uh, by the end of December, hopefully. Um, and then go from there in 2022. Uh, 2023, rather, and uh, also worked with uh, UDOT and uh, CITLA and uh, Moab City with some planning on the South Highway 191 corridor uh, concept, frontage roads, uh, you know, access management, things like that. Um, so that's kind of moving, moving slowly, but it's moving. Uh, a lot of money involved in that. Uh, Finding the funding for that is, will be the, the challenge. Um, also, we, we continue to uh, push snow, you know, for San Juan County and also Castle Valley, and also on Geyser Pass through the trailhead during the winter months in 2021. Um, and we're gearing up for that again for 2022. Some things for the shop I would like to pass along to you from Cody McKinney, our fleet manager, shop supervisor. He does an excellent job. And uh, just some, some highlights, I think. Uh, 2021, they, they w moved over to the Enterprise Fleet Master Agreement or, the, you know, the lease agreement with Enterprise. And, and uh, that is now in working out real well, I think, for 2022. Cody's been managing that real well. Um, in 2021, we got on board with uh, rim, rim to Rim and FFSL and for a project in the, in the wet Matheson wetlands for some mastication, cutting brush, things like that. We fulfilled that uh, in 2022. We were reimbursed uh, 18, little over $18,000 for that project. Um, we did uh, one of uh, the shop employees uh, decided that he wanted to try his hand out on the road uh, crew and in 2021. And so we were short a mechanic, but we filled that this year as well in, 20, in the, for the shop. And so, and he's working out really, really well. It's tighter. And uh, once again, the enterprise factory orders for the vehicles, uh, they're starting to roll in. They've been rolling in this year and they're continuing to roll in. So I think uh, Cody is planning on putting out uh, some surplus vehicles out uh, uh, probably at the end of, end of this month. Uh, so that'll bring some, some revenue back in to some of these departments. Um, I think that, that'll cover that, but they're doing a real good job in the shop. They're keeping up, you know, they they run through all the fleets, but well, I think the county has 130 to somewhere in that neighborhood of fleet that roll, roll through that shop every, you know, at least one time, you know. Um, and, and then of course our road department equipment, you never know when that'll end up in the shop. But uh, so they do a fine job. Um, while I'm on the 
on the new hires, if you will. We've also, uh, Jason, who come from the shop uh, in 2021, he's on a road crew now. Also, we have Steven and Josh and Hans and, and that we hired uh, this year. And uh, so we're fully staffed with the road crew now and, and they're uh, doing a fine job. So appreciate appreciate that, and also the the regular staff that's been here some, some time. I haven't, you know, I, one thing I do want to mention about my staff is, and I haven't looked at it recently, but at one time we had over 250 hours or years. I'm sorry, 250 years of experience on the staff at the road department. Very little turnover for years and years. And so we've had some retirements and things like that. So, but some of these guys that are coming in now have been have, have been working in this kind of work for a long time. You know, a lot, a lot of it's, they're bringing a lot of experience in as well. So that's always nice. Um, in 2022, we'll kind of move on to that. We did finish up the UTMP, and it was approved uh, by y'all this uh, this year in June, I believe it was. We chip sealed six miles of loop road, uh, sill coated uh, uh, eight miles of pathway. And while I'm thinking about it, we uh, sill coated the parking lot at the hub last year in 2021 as well. So. I will just kind of, uh, we did our, we did the best we could with all of our uh, road maintenance, but a lot of our time was filled with flood mitigation and cleanup, all right? Um, Conservative estimates, uh, <clears throat> cleaning off some of our roadways, but the majority of it was in our detention basins. Uh, and the majority of that was over on the, I would say that what I would call the east side, over on the Murphy Lane side, uh, familiar with that area. Uh, and those basins, we've cleaned them out time after time uh, this year. Uh, approximately a, a thousand cubic yards. Uh, which equates to about 1,100 tons you know, of material. That's, I think, conservative. If you were to, if you know where the Murphy Lane pit is, uh, the old hilltop drive-in, uh, go up there and you can see stockpiles of material still standing that we haven't knocked down. Well, we knocked one layer down and started stacking on top of that. So we put a lot of, a lot of material in there. Um, these storms have moved a lot of material throughout the throughout the county. Um, speaking of flood damage, I think that's kind of what's on everybody's mind. Um, we we see it here in the valley for sure. That you know uh, everybody can put their eyes on that. But a lot of people may not have realized that some of our our roads in the outback were damaged pretty severe. Um, Mega bottom switchbacks was was hit fairly hard. Um, I'll have to say it wasn't near as hard as maybe the first initial look at look at it, but it, we it took us you know 20 hours and it was open back up you know so and I I want to give kudos once again to staff on that Dwayne and uh, Josh Josh being one of our newer employees but with a lot of experience uh, they both got down there and and whipped that out real quick in my opinion and. Got that done, I appreciate that. I'm just gonna name off some other roads here. You may may know them. Uh, Floyd, Candy, Floyd area, north of the I-70 was hit pretty hard. We're getting that opened up pretty good now. Uh, that Ruby Ranch Road, uh, the Grand Wash as they call it, that first big wash you come to. Numerous times, uh, water, you know, people stranded. We've been staying on top of that. Long Canyon got hit pretty good. We got that opened up. Uh, the Cisco Boat Dock Road uh, out there at Cisco uh, goes down to the BLM takeout. That bridge got overwhelmed right there. And we do have a go around right now, but that's closed until we can get out there to get it cleaned back up. I did call UDOT, uh, bridge inspect inspectors come out with me and look at it. Uh, uh, you know, it's an old bridge. 1940s type of bridge, but it did not move that bridge. And wow. amazingly enough, it's so we, we got some 
some work to do to get it back open, but the bridge is still functional, will be. Um, Thompson Canyon uh, was hit pretty hard, uh, but at least twice. So we've uh, got some stream alteration permits in the works right now to try to to fix that a little better up for ongoing or future floods, but it is open. Uh, Sago Canyon as well got hit and it's open. Got hit several times. Um, I also want to give uh, thanks to uh, my office staff, uh, Tony Boyd. Uh, uh, she tracked all this work that we've been doing on this flood mitigations, you know, uh, very well, stayed on top of it and made it a lot easier uh, to be able to document those things and get it over to, to the right people in FEMA for possible you know, reimbursement or however that's going to turn out. We hopefully, we'll know shortly. Um, also, Glenn Arthur, the assistant supervisor, he, he does a lot of our permitting for us, and he was busy doing that. You know, we, we got through, uh, I think, four um, gravel per permits uh, emergency permits with the BLM got those submitted and, and turned out pretty quick uh, just to, to repair some of these roads that we need to go back on you know uh, mineral bottoms up or part of mineral bottom We've got a lot of work to do on that as well um, I mentioned a lot of these roads we still got work to do but they're open um, I had mentioned the, the Matheson, Matheson Wetlands uh, Mastication Project. We also went up on the north end early in the, of this year and got some some areas up there that will be, be really good for fire breaks and things like that. It worked out really well. Um, I do want to say that early this year, you all had the opportunity to uh, either approved or not approved, but some pre authorization of uh, 2023 equipment, and you approved it. Appreciate that. Uh, seems like the norm maybe now at lead time on this on things is just taking longer and longer. Matter of fact, I'm still waiting on something. I ordered first of the year, I hadn't showed up at uh, one of my equipment trailers. Hopefully, we'll get it at the end of this year. So, those kind of things. So, I appreciate that. So I probably went over time. Questions? Sounds like a huge team effort, Bill. <laughs> You've got a good team. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, I also wanted to, this This is a good time because you're doing your presentation, but it, um, take a moment to thank you and your entire team because it, it does sound like a, like a true team effort in your department for your great work this year, uh, especially in light of the unprecedented flooding events that you've had to deal with all over the county. It's a huge county. Yeah, sure. And um, yeah, we, it's it's uh, very much appreciated as well as the work you did on the on the trailer fire earlier this year. You guys have gone uh, above and beyond. Um, Roads is one of those essential departments they don't hear about too much um, and mostly notice just when something's gone wrong. But but you guys have done such a great consistent effort throughout the year to keep everything going smoothly. Um, we just wanted to express appreciation. So. Well, thank, thank you very much and, and pass it along to uh, to everybody at your department. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you on behalf of all the staff. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Well, better be a big one because I got a lot of staff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right, we're up to our approval of minutes for the uh, November 1st um, regular commission meeting uh, workshop. I would move to approve the minutes of November 1st. Thanks, Evan. Second. All right, um, any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approval of minutes, raise your hand. All right, looks like that passes unanimously, um, six to nothing. And um, on to ratification of bills and general reports. Um, uh, ratification of bills in the amount of uh, $415,235.70 and payroll in the amount of 
$323,155.52 for a grand total in the amount of $738,391.22. Did anyone like to make a motion? So moved. Thanks, Mary. Second. I think Sarah beat you there, Evan. <laughs> All right, uh, motion by Mary and a second by Sarah. Any discussion on bills? They seem uh, lower this period for some reason. <laughs> anyway, um, all, all those in favor of the bills, uh, raise your hand, passes unanimously. Uh, on to commission member disclosures. Does anyone have anything that they need to disclose, disclose uh, concerning today's agenda? All right, looks like nobody does. So we will move on to general commission reports and future considerations. And I will go to uh, Kevin. Are you ready for that in Zoom land? Um, no, why don't you call me a little bit later? Okay, <laughs> I'll start with Josie then. Um, I don't have much beyond uh, the kind of budgeting process we have all been a party to. I did go to a housing task force meeting on the third um lots of good work being done as usual but exciting is that the um the sort of housing fair event series that has been in the works is going to begin with its first installation on december 5th that'll take place at the mark um the topic covered will be sort of a general awareness around um just all things housing uh in grand county and i think um just sort of getting people acquainted with uh general language and all the things that we're going to be talking about uh, more specifically and further events, there will be food um, and also just a lot of solicitation of feedback because there is still an active housing plan that's in the works. Uh, so it's always good to get public input on that. So that's exciting. And that's all I've got. Thanks, Jersey. Uh, Evan? Uh, I met with the health district. Um, it's budget season, so there's a lot of things there. There's a lot of... Uh, getting into the nitty gritty about some of the other facilities that uh, are funded through our special service district. One of the most exciting things was uh, there was a hundredth birthday. So that's now three centarians, is that the word, that are living there, as well as two 99-year-olds. So um, pretty impressive. Um, and then uh, there was a budget hearing for EMS last night. And that budget was um, approved or adopted this morning, uh, as well as some other kind of year end housekeeping with EMS. And um, I believe that's all I got. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I attended the Noxious Weed Board meeting, which really highlighted the need for housing, maybe specific. Typically, Grand County operated housing for seasonal technicians, or I don't know. But they have applications open for every single position besides wow. the director right now. So, how, how many interested. positions are those? I think it's just three. Three? Yeah. Three out of four? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, and, and just anecdotally, they keep losing employees because of housing. Yeah they lose their housing and then they have to leave. So, um, but Izzy is doing a great job and carrying on and without help. So I also attended the Mosquito Abatement District board meeting and we discussed budgets. We set our public hearing for budget, which will be the first week in December um, on the 5th and our takeaway is that we are absolutely going to have to raise our taxes in order to cover the budget salaries. That's like the only increase that has happened in the past years, and we just can't even keep up with what we have. So um, that if you're interested in that, come to our public hearing. Um, the facility situation out there is also pretty dire, and as I'm transitioning i think some of my mo most important this is one of my most important boards i think the mosquito abatement yeah. district needs a really strong commission engagement um the facilities are shared weed department and the mosquito special service district 
and they they just need to be upgraded. There's historic site contamination. There's inappropriate storage facilities for pesticides and herbicides. There's shared office space and all of the things that come with that. So, and the roof is like flapping off and kind of unfixable. So there, something needs to happen there. And I feel like I wish I could carry on in that role to see it through, but I trust you all to, to deal with it soon. Um, Council on Aging met this month also. And that's really great. It was in kind of a hiatus for a few years because of COVID, but um, Karen Fury is leaving the charge as chair and they're doing really, it's a really wonderful group. And I think that they're gonna really help with a lot of the outreach um, aspects of the Grand Center. And I attended the Community Renewable Energy Program meeting. We're slightly behind schedule. I told you we would bring a utility agreement by the end of the year um, for the commission to agree to. I, I think it might be closer to the beginning of next year. So I don't, I don't know, but there's a strong, strong leadership there and they can walk everyone through how to stay engaged. Um, I also was part of the interview committee for the special events coordinator and we had some excellent applicants but we're still in the deciding phase of that and um, attended the budget meetings. Yeah, so I had kind of busy. You did have a busy couple of weeks. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Mary? Okay, uh, had budget advisory. And then on uh, Monday the 7th, we had a future site committee meeting. And tomorrow in the city chambers, we're having our first open house for everyone to come and see what has been done, get some education of what can and can't happen on the site, and give your ideas. So we we spent most of our meeting uh, working on that and getting prepared for it. It's, uh, and just to clarify, Mary, you're talking about the UMTRA site. Right. Excuse me, I did yeah. not make that clear. I, I didn't even <laughs> just, I, I knew what you were talking about, but just to let everyone <laughs> yeah, know. So anyway, future sites committee for the UMTRA project for where the tailings are. So that was, uh, it was really worthwhile. And we, as we also planned our trip. We went to, uh, see if I can pronounce it right, Las Crosas City Park in uh, Grand Junction, which is uh, the park that used to be a tailings pile, and they have uh, moved it, and they only had to move 4 million tons compared to our 16. They had it easy. So uh, it was, so on my Wednesday, the 8th, or 9th, that was the night, we went, I went to the we took a field trip over there. It was fascinating. I learned a whole lot about how they're making it work. And one thing that we they're doing is you can't buy that property, even if it's deeded over to the city. And they wanted to have a business park to help pay for you know, improvements and everything. And so they created a hundred year lease so that people would be willing to do it. And so there, uh, and it's interesting when you're at those sites, you uh, can never take away groundwater. You can't remove it, move it off the site. And uh, uh, dirt itself, any dirt that's moved around the site always has to be tested if you want to remove it from the site. And uh, they're doing a lot. They're having private uh, and, uh, public type of things. They have a beautiful amphitheater. I'm, we're going to give a better report and I'll show everything uh, you know, at a later date. We'll bring the whole team that went and give a report probably after the year So, because we have so much going on. The other thing we did was we went, and I got this for everyone, we went to what's called the Atomic Legacy uh, and I want to take one to Doug too, uh, cabin. And it's open to the public. You can, see, uh, you can see the times on the back. When you go to Grand Junction, I highly recommend visiting this cabin if you're there at the time on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. It was fascinating. It's the history of uh, pretty much uh, the uh, use of uranium and such in our 
area in the Colorado Plateau area. You can see where all the mines and such are. It's a history that starts before, but it was fascinating is um, Yulehi, who uh, started it, was high up in the Manhattan Project. I mean, they were doing all this secret work over in Grand Junction. They they set their uh, face up between the river and the uh, railroad track. So it's fascinating. I highly recommend, I want to give this to Doug so that you'll have that information, but it's a bit well worth your while going to see. You will learn a lot. And it, I, I kept wondering, why do they want to take us to this cabin? <laughs> I was very glad they did. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, then we had an airport board. Uh, there was, they're dealing with a roof leak in the new part of the terminal, uh, the helicopter incident at Mineral Bottoms they had to deal with, and they did not notify dispatch correctly. There was a security breach during uh, a SkyWest getting on the plane. Somebody left the crowd and walked over to the fence, which is a total no-no. You can't do that to talk to somebody. So they had to take everybody off the plane. It was just... But most of the people's reaction were they were glad they were following protocol. Mm -hmm. But there was very, you know, some people were real angry, but some aren't. Uh, they've had some damages to uh, places that aren't in cameras, so they're they're buying additional cameras for more. And uh, you know, on November 29th, we go back to one flight a day. Uh, in planements for United was uh, 200, 2050 so far this year, and Delta was uh, 1,052. Uh, there were no cancellations last month. And they were very happy about that because that's been an issue. And so uh, that, I'll drop that. I went uh, travel council meeting. Uh, tourism was down throughout the state. So... Uh, that, you know, the fact that we're there, you know, the rumor that uh, it's because of timed entry and uh, 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 the change of our TRT laws, it's obviously not that because it's an issue that the entire state is facing. So uh, I'm going to stop there. All right. Thanks, Mary. Kevin, you uh, you ready? Sure. Um, yeah, I looked, looked at my calendar that most of the meetings I attended the last few weeks are coming up, you know, on different agenda items. Um, I did, you know, I discussed our new special events policy or procedures um, with the BLM and they expressed an interest in, you know, sort of working, I think, especially on smaller events to, you know, eliminate ambiguity and unnecessary red tape. So, you know, we might think of doing some fine tuning or at least, you know, mutually edu educating each other about our procedures on those. Um, and there was a, a budget meeting for the um, Rhodes Special Service District. Um, that's it. All right, thank you. And I uh, had a couple of, couple of few meetings, um, a trail mix meeting where we uh, talked about um, first kind of volunteer scheduled maintenance days, which will be uh, on various trails that those maintenance days will be the first Monday monthly at 4 p.m. And uh, they just had their first one on the um, Hidden Valley Trail. <laughs> um, the next one will be uh, at the Brands Trails in December, the first Monday in December, the 5th, I believe that is. Um, also what discussed was adding an uh, active transportation rep to the um, to the trail mix kind of rep family, which includes like climbing and mountain biking or yeah, climbing, biking, hiking, trail running, et cetera. So um, it was agreed that that would be a good idea. And we'd uh, look for a rep to represent the active transportation segment in our county. And uh, last was the Hawks Glide new trail opening today that Andrea uh, touched on earlier. Um, and there's also a trail ambassador appreciation party at the mark going on right now. Um, so if we have time after the meeting, uh, it sounds like that might go till about eight ish, then I will probably roll over there and express my appreciation to the trail ambassadors. Um, I also attended a, uh, Thompson, uh, special service district meeting where the, uh, tank contamination from last month was discussed, uh, that 
that contamination cost uh, the, the district about $33,000 to clean up. Um, they are applying for a grant from the Division of Drinking Water. Um, they have grants up to $40,000 that hopefully that will be covered for Thompson. Um, then we also discussed the fact that there's two board positions uh, are opening up by the end of the year and how to um, post those and go about um, uh, appointing new board members in Thompson. Um, there's also an update on the BLM spring that Thompson is looking at for potential uh, more water. And it looks like the BLM came back and wants the special service districts to prove that it is not a wetland before moving forward with that. So that was a bit of an interesting development. Um, I also attended a motorized trail committee meeting. Um, uh, the discussion there involved um, like the 10 major areas in the Moab uh, motorized trail area, uh, mo Moab area trail systems that needed more than just kind of rudimentary maintenance, like focus areas to, to go out and do some work and, um, and maintenance on next year uh, while they're scheduling maintenance projects. And then also, as actually Andrea alluded to earlier, um, uh, at your leisure, the TV show that that comes on in Utah on Sundays, I believe, uh, filmed our meeting. They were doing a piece on collaboration between um, local uh, businesses, user groups, um, and then um, the motorized trail committee, government groups, et cetera. Uh, There's some good positive conversation there. And then we actually went out and did a field trip after that. Um, Andrea was on that. I went out there and uh, rode in a jeep and did uh hell's revenge pretty much for the first time <laughs> and, and uh that was interesting and then we actually did some trail work out there um and at your leisure filmed uh the group doing the the trail maintenance so that was also interesting um and that's it for me other than the budget stuff that we've all done yeah mary i had a couple of future considerations i forgot to mention. oh yeah go ahead uh one is i would like to get a report from our staff staffs that are involved to find out what happened and where we stand with the flooding and the second consideration as we mentioned today in our budget workshop i'd like to have the commission be able to get their uh, laptops and such on a secure system rather than a non-secure system we should be able to have the password and the ability to do so for one reason it's uncomfortable to be on an unsecure you know, an, an unsecure system for such a long time, sometimes up to eight or so hours. And then secondly, uh, it blinks out on us so often and we have to reboot. So I would like to, for future considerations, get all the commissioners' laptops so that they're on a secured uh, line rather than, rather than the guest. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, we are on to elected official reports. Um, it doesn't, uh, I guess Gabriel is on, our county clerk. Gabe, you got something you want to uh, report on? Hi there, yeah, thanks, Jacques. Um, I'm in St. George right now, getting ready to be at the UAC um, annual uh, conference. Sorry, I can't be there with you in person. Um, just wanted to remind everyone real quick that uh, this Friday, the 18th, uh, we have both the post-election audit and the election schedule canvas, or election canvas scheduled. Um, the post-election audit it will begin at 10 a.m. Um, and the canvas uh, will be at, oh uh, shucks, I'm just like losing my train of thought here. Um, is it 2 p I think it's 2 or it's 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. I forget I think, uh, it. Quinn says it's 1 p.m. Thank you, Quinn. 1 p.m. That's kind of what I thought. Um, or that's what's, that's what's on the calendar anyway. And then just to notify you all in the public or just to let everyone know that, um, you know, as you may be aware, um, there are still provisional ballots um, as well as ballots postmarked by the 7th that were uh, received after Election Day, um, as well as ballots that needed curing, which... Uh, uh, in this case means that they still needed a signature on their envelopes. Anyway, y'all are aware that there are still some ballots that remain uncounted by the clerk's office. Um, those ballots are set to be counted on Thursday. 
Um, if you want the most up-to-date number on how many of how many such ballots um, are planning to be counted on Thursday, um, please contact the clerk auditor's office tomorrow. I don't have the most update up-to-date number with me, so I don't want to quote anything right now on the record. That's all for now. Great. Thanks, Gabe. Have a, have a great conference. Is It doesn't look like uh, our county attorney, Christina Sloan, is online. So it doesn't look like we have any other elected here. So we'll move on to uh, commission administrator report. Um, Mallory's on a much uh, deserved vacation. So that's you, Quinn. Yippee. <laughs> Looking forward to Mallory coming back on Thursday. Although she's been joking, she's not coming back. <laughs> no, no. Um, Alicia and I helped out the election. It seemed like it went really smoothly. I think Alicia and I opened almost every single ballot. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was it a lot. We were here till about nine o'clock at night. But yeah, things went smooth. It seemed like it was a good turnout. Um, we've been working on some special event software and rolling that out. That keeps moving forward slowly but surely. Um, we got some boards of vacancy software that Alicia demonstrated last time. That's getting closer to rolling out and I set in on the special event coordinator interviews with some other commissioners. That's all I have for now. All right. Thanks, Quinn. Anything to add? All right. Um, we are up to our uh, general business action items. And uh, our first action item is uh, consideration of an ordinance to amend Article 4, Special Purpose Overlay District to establish a alternative dwelling overlay district pilot program. So we have uh, an issue in that Elisa Martin is on vacation and unavailable right now. And Jenna Borney is out with COVID. So we don't have anyone to present on this. Um, we have, this has come up at two other meetings. We've done a workshop on it. Um, I personally would probably feel more comfortable uh, going forward with this maybe next time when one of them are around, but if I, I would put it to you all, if you all feel differently, if you're, I know we've, we've talked about this a ton. So if, if I would, I would accept uh, direction on how you all would like to proceed. Looks I like mean, Kevin I unmuted. Think, yeah, we, we went over pretty thoroughly last time and agreed on a pretty small number of changes, which, which have been made. So um, maybe we don't really need a presenter or, <clears throat> or I could pull up a if copy you, and point yeah, to you, if, I think if you feel pretty comfortable with everything in there, I've definitely read it a few times then, um, yeah. How, how do the rest of you all, any, any opinion there as to whether to go forward or, or postpone it? Uh, I'm comfortable moving forward. Me too. Yeah. I would like to, you know, I know people are waiting for this so that they can actively start some projects and so especially with kevin reading it through again i feel pretty comfortable okay yeah if you want to read through it kevin I, I think we've all talked about this a lot maybe start with the changes that were made from the last um version we saw at the last meeting or or whatever you feel comfortable with presenting yeah so, so, so maybe we could um postpone this until just slightly later in the agenda let me pull it up and, and you know find the, the relevant passages um so, so could we? Um, oh, that sounds good. You want to make a motion to table it till the end of the yeah, agenda? Yeah, so let's ta table it until so, some point later in the agenda to be, to be decided. So I'll, I'll move that we table it for now. Second. All right. Um, all in favor of the motion to table this until the uh, we can move it to after item five, I think. All in favor? Yes. All right. Motion passes. And I'd note for you, Kevin, that I think. Um, changes are in green to be a little bit more helpful awesome. finding those right thanks okay great thank you kevin yeah, they are okay we'll move on to uh the second item uh i think the applicants yeah. uh, yes yeah okay so okay we don't have planning and zoning but we do have the applicants okay that's that's great um so we'll move on to adopting resolution approving the final plat of jnm subdivision located at 2468 san jose road and again our planning and zoning folk are not going to be here but we have the applicants if you guys do you guys want to come forward and you can have a seat at the table in front here 
So um, you want me to take a stab at this one? Right. Yeah, that we, we do information in our packet. Um, yeah, Evan, that'd be great if you want to if you want to just run through it real quick. Sure. In our packet, there's a, included a staff recommendation. It says the final plat is consistent with the requirements set forth on Grand County Land Use Code Section 9.5. Final plats, Article 7 subdivision standards and Article 5 lot design standards. Review and consider the application materials provided. This is an administrative decision. Staff recommends that the county commission approve the final plat for JM subdivisions and associated documents. Uh, just some background with this the property consists of a one acre parcel zoned large lot residential. One dwelling unit exists on the property along with one well house structure currently serving the existing home. This subject parcel is being subdivided to create two lots. The front lot, lot one, will be 0.488 acres, and the rear lot, lot two, will be 0.50 acres. 0 0.02 acres of land fronting San Jose will be recorded as county road dedication. Lot one is currently served by Grand Water Sewer. <laughs> the new structure is built on lot two. Such structure will also be served by WISA. As recommended by GWISA, the applicant will install all connections for water and sewer prior to the road surface widening. Those associated connection fees have already been paid. The well house currently serves as secondary water source for the dwelling on lot one. No utilities other than individual service lines need to be extended to serve the parcel and all unnecessary utilities are in place immediately adjacent to the, the property. So with that, to start any discussion, I would move to approve the findings of facts set forth in the staff report dated August 29th, 2022, and the proposed resolution approving the final plat of J&M subdivision with the following conditions. The owner shall record the SIA simultaneously with the final plat in the recorder's office, and the owner shall submit an acceptable completion assurance bond for the public improvements and infrastructure as established in the SIA to the county and the amount set forth in the SIA prior to the record recordation of the final plat. All right, thanks, Evan. And I would add that the planning and zoning staff uh, have um, recommended approval for this. But second. All right, uh, we have a motion on the table. Discussion or questions for the applicants? All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote on the motion to approve. All those in favor, raise your hand, say aye. All right, and the motion passes unanimously, six to nothing. Thank you, guys. That was that was easy. <laughs> we had a couple of <laughs> Sometimes it happens that way. You, you're uh, you, you got lucky. Very <laughs> administrative. Yeah. Well, thank you very awesome. much. Well, thank you. And yeah. Kevin, I, I saw Hawk at the alumni graduation party last year. Yeah. And so this, so this, sorry, I just want to take the opportunity to talk to Evan. <laughs> scared me here. At, oh, yeah. at the graduation party, I have this trivia, right? The kids make big money answering trivia questions. And Hawk had to correct me because I, I asked the question, which 2020 Grand County High School graduate was named after a Star Wars character? And immediately um, it was Kenobi, right? <laughs> All right. And, and Hogg jumped in. He said, Kenobi didn't graduate in Grant County. So where did he graduate? Oh, he graduated he... somewhere. So I had to give Hawk the equivalent of the same. Nice. <laughs> uh, he went to a boarding school in Carbondale, Colorado. Carbondale. Yeah. yeah As so. he said, it was in Colorado. And he yeah. said, I can prove it. And I said, like, Hawk, here, here's your $10 grant. <laughs> so, Ten uh, bucks. All right. So yeah. tell Kenobi we say hi and tell him okay. to it's well, been yeah. a while since we've seen the good kid. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Thank good you all. You. All right. Um, on to item number three, approving new airport ground lease for lot uh, 118 for foundation properties, for foundation properties, LLC, for 25 years and approving termination of old 2027 Red Tail Air lease for the same lot. Uh, Tammy Howland, airport director, and it looks like Tammy is with us on Zoom. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a uh, cancellation of um, an existing lease with Redtail Air, um, and then a new lease for that same lot to the foundation partners. Um, Redtail was going to build a hangar there. They sold the material off um, to this company and want to. Um, we didn't do a transfer because we have a new lease template. So it's a, a whole new lease for them with the updated template. Was this uh, run through the attorney's office as well? 
<clears throat> yes, um, it did go out um, for legal review and uh, approval through airport board. I move to approve the new airport ground lease for lot 188 for the found, uh, foundation properties LLC for 25 years. And I move to approve the termination of the old uh, 2017 red tail le air lease for the same lot. Thanks, Mary. Second. All right, I have a motion by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Clapper. Any discussion? or further questions for Tammy. Nope. All right, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And looks like that passes unanimously. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks, everybody. All right, we're up to approving a resolution requesting the recertification of the Grand County Justice Court. Uh, Renee Baker, Personal Services. Um, is uh, Judge Welch so Donaldson in the chamber? She is. I will let her take over presenting. She's got less okay, background great. noise than me. Uh, you should have the opinion letter from the county attorney, my affidavit, uh, the checklist, and then uh, there's a court security plan, which we didn't include for obvious reasons, and also the court already has a copy of that, or the AOC. Should have a copy of the resolution. This is just something that the justice courts have to approve or have to be recertified every four years just to ensure that um, they're going by all of the operating procedures required by the state and the AOC. And we more than need all of those. And as you can see in the update. All right. Thank you. Any uh, any questions? I move to approve the proposed. Resolution titled a resolution requesting the recertification of Grand County's Justice Court. I'll second. All right. Uh, motion by Commissioner McGann and second by Commissioner Stock. Any further discussion on this approval? All right. Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand. And the motion passes uh, unanimously, six to nothing. So that was, that was another easy one. <laughs> Thank you. The way. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So we are back to our first uh, action. Are we? Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, I totally missed number five. Uh, so we're up to number five, cooperative agreement between Utah State University Extension and Grand County. And uh, uh, Chris Baird presenting, is Chris online or is he um, here? Okay. So I can discuss this a little bit. This is a ongoing agreement that we've had for the last few years. Um, Mary might actually be able to speak to it better than I can since she's the one that signed it last time. But this is an operating agreement between the county and Utah State University to provide programming that or agricultural services and resources and information for homeowners. It's in the packet. We've approved it years in the past. We need to decide whether we want to do a one-year or a multi-year agreement. Uh, we do it almost every year. We probably should do a multi. <laughs> I think they offer a lot of great services and um, I'm comfortable with a, a multi-year. I would. I think that if Chris were here, he would say he doesn't like doing multi-year agreements without solid agreements in place, but this seems like one we do every year. So uh, I don't and know what so I, with this I'm not action, advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying that's what Chris would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone else have a comment on this? Kevin, do you have do you have anything you wanted to add or oh no. Okay. Well then. And then there do seem to be some amounts in some of the older ones. <laughs> And I don't know if we need to address those amounts or keep them the same. Yeah, that's. Catherine was here, but she had to step out. Well, uh, where were where were the amounts before? You under the budget under the old 2021 co op agreement, you can see the oh, yeah. 21. Oh, 21. 
Right, because Appendix A doesn't have an amount. You're right, it does not. Does that, I mean, is it up to us to decide that amount? I mean, shouldn't that be negotiated before we before it comes here? Seems like it should be. <laughs> I, I know. I don't. Uh, oftentimes, there's a presentation from the extension staff with an ask. And so I don't know if... Uh, is this something that's super urgent? Could we, is this something we could postpone till the next what was meeting? The, Do you guys know? Yes, we've usually had the person had from the like extension. Said, Catherine was here, but I think we got our wires crossed and she came at two. Ah, uh, uh, she had appointment five. Oh, so. uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That I, one. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I was wondering, I was so curious. So we want to postpone. I, I'm fine with that. I can uh, so I, I, I move to postpone until the next meeting. Thanks, Kevin. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor of postponing, raise your hand. Looks like that passes. So we'll postpone that until the December 6th meeting. Um, okay, thanks. So now we are back to uh, action item one, uh, consider an ordinance to amend Article 4, Special Purpose Overlay Districts to establish an alternative Oops. dwelling overlay district pilot program. Okay, and then I, I somehow um, lost my window, so I, I will have it up again very quickly. Um, it's six o'clock. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, I I think while Kevin's looking that up, we can hear from a concerned citizen about this. That sounds fine to me. Anyone else disagree? No, because we could be gone by eight. By six, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Courtney, do you want to make a comment? That would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this has been a long time coming, and I just wanted to applaud the commission for taking on this sticky subject. Um, and it's very much an appropriate measure considering the dire shortage of housing in our community. Uh, I also view this as an appropriately affordable mechanism for housing when compared to the continually rising cost of stick built and modular construction. Um, I also really love the intent to apply approval process that y'all have put in here. Uh, that's been a major barrier to entry for locals to develop their properties, in my opinion. Um, the two little concerns I would like to share are first in section 4.9.4, um, that deed restriction just seems like there's not really anything in place to make sure that these are used locally. So I'm wondering if there might be some sort of way to just put some minor addition to the deed restriction. Uh, it seems like it might have just swung too far in the other direction on any kind of restriction. And then the second question that I had is on section 4.9.6G, the lapse of approval of a site plan. Um, if a site plan is not approved within six months, that just feels like a really short timeline based on our experience for the site plan application process. A year seems like it would be a little more realistic for people to get all the way through uh, the design process and legal review. Um, but in short, I believe in living tiny and allowing alternative housing ideologies. And I really appreciate what y'all are doing. So thank you. All right, thank you, Courtney. Um, Kevin, are we uh, hey, let's back see on? If I can share the correct window this time. Um, how does that look? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so um, as we mentioned before, this this has been, we've had kind of long discussions about this at two previous meetings. At the last meeting, we were very close and just a few changes needed to be, needed to be made. So I'm first just gonna go through those, ch what's changed since the last time we had this. Um, one thing is these, um, these, you know, things to be considered um, when, when approving a development. Um, and there's item C, historic use of the property, including historic use of, 
primitive dwellings. Um, and the one I meant to highlight is um, item B, compatibility with the existing community characteristics, including density for future land use designation. Um, I think the thing that we've debated the most is, um, you know, all of, all of us say we don't really intend these to be plunked down in the middle of a relatively rural residential parts of the county. Um, but we didn't want to just specify the zones because so much of the county is already zoned rural residential, including some parcels that many of us think might be appropriate for one of these. Um, so that was the last piece of debate. And um, there was some discussion about adding language that was even more specific than what's included here, especially this item B. And ultimately, Elisa felt, and I agreed with her, that it was it was just hard to come up with language that made it more specific with, without inadvertently excluding some things we didn't want to exclude. So I feel, and I think a majority of us at the last meeting felt that what's in here is good enough. Um, another th one thing that's changed is item E, just that previously it said, you know, within one mile, it gave kind of a hard cut off. And I, I think the consensus last time was that that didn't make sense. So now it's the language is a little bit softer about being located there, but all, all of these point toward placing these things, you know, along roads with more traffic closer to town or other places of employment, um, not in the middle of, you know, Southern Spanish Valley or something like that. Um, the other big addition is a, something about a tent to apply, which Courtney mentioned. Um, and so this is an idea that I guess we sort of copied from the um, special event approval where we don't, if, you know, if there's a chance that an application might be turned down, we want people to find that out sooner before they invest a lot of time and energy into coming up with the plan. Um, so this this lays it out. I won't read all of it, but it's a pretty simple, and there's some characteristics, these right here, that have to be in place for the intent to apply. And then if if you they get the thumbs up there, then they can do some of the more time-consuming parts of the application, these, these later later things like here and here. Um, and I think, oh, and then and then the, fi the final thing that wasn't quite resolved last time is the schedule of quarterly reviews. I, I think the intent was clear last time, but the language wasn't quite right. So now just to keep things interesting, we're doing triannual reviews <laughs> every four months instead of every three months. Um, and it, it does make it clear that this is a you know an, an ongo ongoing process. I, I I think accidentally some of the previous draft um, made it seem like there was just going to be a single one of these meetings. So that's it for the changes. Um, and maybe I'll pause to see if anyone has any questions. All right. Um, to uh, Courtney's point, is there a reason not to extend it the uh, six months to a year, especially if we're only reviewing these every four months? Oh, great. Um, yeah, I'm for, I, I think that's a year just to get the, the site plan approved, which is not something that happens with one of these. So that that's, um, so I, yeah, I don't know whether six months is the right number, but I but I think that's independent of these once every four months review processes. That's not where site plans get approved. Sure, I uh, I would like to see these come to fruition, and so if giving a little more time, if that's the feedback we're getting, then um, uh, I currently don't see a reason not to do um, twelve months on that. So I would be okay with making that edit as well unless i'm missing something yeah i mean just I, I i understand what you're saying um the other hand elise is not here and um you know we, we could maybe make the change later um so you know i think there is a an argument for just improving what we have in front of us and not messing with it further but i, I guess that is a pretty simple change just changing the six to a twelve Another reason against it is if we're trying to get these online very soon, because, you know, this is, you know, we have an urgent need for housing and this, unlike a lot of the other projects, is something that can happen really quickly. We don't want someone to get approved and then take up part of the quota that we have in here and then not do anything for a year. That just doesn't seem. Right, right. A hard deadline tends to motivate people a little bit more. Yeah. And there is language 
to extend for six months. I know it's a little bit more of a laborious process, but I wonder if that's adequate or if, yeah, I don't know. I guess my tendency would be to stick with what we have in front of us. Yeah, I do think Courtney brought up a great <clears throat> point with the occupancy requirements. And we had a lot of discussion about this back and forth throughout planning commission and then workshopping with the commission. Um, and I think we came, we came to this less stringent requirement uh, for occupancy in the hopes that um, it didn't create a huge burden of enforcement. And we were also really considering the employee who who is seasonal and is maybe only here for a few months or uh, yeah, I don't know. So we this is where we landed on. And you know, I I look I look at them and I'm like, yeah, that is pretty bare bones. And I hope it doesn't get abused. Yeah, I think I mean talking to some of the um sort of already existing parks that are are sort of transitioning in this direction. Also, it seemed pretty clear that it would be relatively obvious if things were being abused uh, within a development just by the inhabitants who are there. I know there was discussion of, you know, people being afraid of losing their housing if they kind of ratted someone out, but um, it does seem, I don't know, I'm not sure about the likelihood of it going that direction. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it, I think we've discussed it enough that I, I feel comfortable with that right now. Yeah. I, I also want to say uh, Trish has been the most, I think, vocal uh, opponent of this among us, and she's not here. And she wanted me to just re-express her opinion that if we do pass this, she'd like us to consider uh, mapping and a pilot starting with only 50 units. So it's not my opinion, just just it out there from Trish. Yeah, I think when that came up before, there was a question about uh, current commercial ones. Um, I don't know if rezoning is the correct word, but that was, that was my concern was that, that um, a couple of projects that are ready to go might gobble up all those 50 right away. So. Yeah, and like I, to leave space for for others to come. And I still think if we do approve it at 150, that it's un, very unlikely that more than 100 would probably end up getting built at the first phase anyway. From what people have said. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I this was discussed last time, and I, I think Evan makes a good point that um, you know because some of these things could could happen very quickly that you know we could reach 50 very fast. So yeah. Just just by converting ex existing places that are now technically, um, you know, standard RV parks. So you know, we wouldn't actually gain housing; it would just be a reclassification. Um, so the, there wasn't a, a sample motion in the packet, um, but I I could try to make one. Um, so I I move to. A, approve the ordinance to amend Article 4, special purpose overlay districts, and to establish an alternative dwelling overlay district pilot program. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Second. All right. Motion on the table by Commissioner Walker and a second by Commissioner McGann. Um, I feel pretty good about this having uh, been discussed and workshopped. and workshopped and discussed and workshopped in the planning commission as well. I think it's been in front of the public a lot. We've had a lot of comment and discussion, and I don't think it's ever going to be perfect, but I feel pretty good about this as it's presented. It's a pilot program, um, so we can take it up again next year. But uh, I do think that this is crucial housing and um, that it's going to make a big difference. Yeah. Um, um, oh, go ahead, Evan. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, there's still some things that I don't absolutely love or that seems like it could be clearer or kind of targeting in exactly what we're kind of like hoping to get out of this 
but I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think if we continue to tool this over and over and over that we're just going to keep kicking the can down the road. And I would really like to see um, some of these coming online sooner than later, like hopefully by the spring. And so um, I hope that we can continue to, to kind of uh, keep it um, on the forefront. But in the meantime, I'm comfortable approving it as it is to, to keep the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I just wanted to say, you know, I, I think for the most part, we're, you know, we, we discussed this pretty thoroughly in previous meetings, but for anyone who tuned in just now, um, it's worth saying that, you know, the, the idea behind this is we've already got, you know, trailer parks and RV parks in the valley. Um, and that's if we could get a version of those that, um, that's for you know long-term residential housing that would take some of the pressure you know that would help with our housing crisis. Um, we've already got lots of people living illegally in vehicles and trailers, and so this would be a pathway to inappropriate locations to make that legal. Um, and it, this is not, I, I think, some early stages of this, or you know, some people have misapprehended this as being a as being an attempt to legalize trailers in people's backyards, and that's. Definitely not the intent, I, and I don't think that would fit because of the restrictions and numbers of units and lot sizes. And and I think all, yeah, to me, it's it's very clear that this this ordinance is is not aimed at that. So I, I just wanted to make it clear, make it clear to any reporters reporting on this that this, this is about um, set, setting up areas which one could think of as you know residential RV, RV parks or similar things. Yeah, well said, Kevin. Thank you. Any further discussion before we uh, vote? Kevin, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Sure. All right. Motion uh, by Commissioner Walker and a second by Commissioner McGann. All those in favor of the motion, uh, raise your hand. And the motion passes six to nothing. All right. That was a uh, kind of a long time coming. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Gwen. It is just after six o'clock. Um, it doesn't look like there's anybody in the chambers unless uh, Doug would like to come forward and be heard. Uh, is there anyone online who is here to make a comment? Seeing none, we'll proceed to the consent agenda. Um, on the consent agenda today, we have a Memorandum of Understanding between Grand County and Utah Geological Survey, Matheson Wetlands Preserve Water Budget, uh, Brine Layer and Vegetation Analysis, Fiscal Year 23 and Fiscal Year 24. Uh, we have 2022 HVAC replacement, um, ICA First Amendment. Uh, we have approval of letter of support for Moab City's application to the Rural Communities Opportunity Grant, and uh, the we also have the Memorandum of Understanding among the U.S. Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, Colorado State Office, and Grand County for development of the Gunnison Sagegrass Resource Management Plan Amendment and Environmental Impact Statement. And lastly, we have uh, a ratification of the Stanley bid for door motors at the Grand Center. I move to approve the consent agenda as read by Jacques. Thank you. Motion by Commissioner Stock, second by Commissioner Clapper. Uh, any discussion of the consent agenda? All right, all those in favor of passing the consent agenda, um, raise your hand. And looks like that passes unanimously. Um, awesome, we are at the end of our agenda. So unless anyone else has anything they want to say, I will adjourn uh, this regular commission meeting at 6.06. Thanks, everybody.